All right, well, thank you for coming. Uh, as you can see from the screen, and of course you knew from your program, that the topic is the first of two parts, the post-Christian future, part one, thinking theologically about the utopian impulse as a perversion of the Judeo-Christian worldview. Now, I'll confess that <clears throat> this session and, you know, to some extent, the second one is sort of a thought experiment on my part because I have uh, I've had my head in the sequel uh, to the facade for a while now. And one of the trajectories I want to try to chase down is this thing that I'm calling here the utopian impulse. And that's in part prompted by where we are at culturally. It's also prompted by some of the, uh, the cultural and political trajectories that I see. I mean, what, what we think of as conspiracy, and you know, I, I think a lot of it is small c conspiracy, but is not actually new. There's always been sort of this impulse to either create the perfect society or more pertinently, force it on people. And so I, I, I see looming on the horizon a new effort at creating a wonderful, blissful, totalitarian state. <laughs> and I want to sort of pursue that a little bit and, and talk about it. And again, for, for those of you here, for those of you who, who listen uh, later to uh, the presentation, I just want you to, to, to get you thinking about why, why it is that this always seems to rear its ugly head and why even Christians uh, at times are not immune from this notion that we can make things perfect, that we can just make it all right. If we did this, that, and the other thing, everything would be okay. Uh, so I wanna, I wanna try to think theologically about those things and we'll see what happens. So here's our roadmap for the day. I'm gonna be trying to define what I mean and then give you the elements of utopianism and then I'll give you some examples, and then we'll move to an evaluation section. And I want to sort of strip away uh, the, the mask of utopianism and then critique it a little bit, again, theologically, in light of biblical theology, and then talk about you know, how in the world did we get to where we're at and sort of what we might be looking at. Again, these are going to be broad strokes in this session. In the next session, I'm going to be a little more specific as, as far as what I think we're going to be having to deal with uh, as a believing community, okay, as, as the real church uh, in the future. So, first part, definition and relevance. Utopia, as you may or may not know, again, is this idea of a perfect human society. The term itself refers to an ideal place that actually doesn't exist. It's imaginary, you know, it's conceptual, it, it, it's this grand wish, something that can't be real in the real world, but boy, we wish it was, uh, that sort of thing. And again, the breakdown uh, for the term utopia, no place, a good or no place. Again, you, you can, you'll see it spelled either with the E or with the you know, O-U, you know, forming the U in either case but it actually could have either derivation, depending on who, who's using it. And again, an imaginary world where social justice is achieved, whatever that means, and the means of guaranteeing all that are secure. That's where the control comes in. So that's what we're talking about. And as far as the impulse, what are the elements? I mean, what, if, if you are utopian in your thinking, what are you thinking? What are you you know, what's in the forefront of your mind. Now, these things are not all present all the time, but they're all important to different utopian systems. So as far as elements, there's typically an ecological element, and that is the idea that we ought to be existing in a harmonious relationship to nature. And the buzzword, of course, today is sustainability. But there's, there's something to do with humanity's relationship to their environment, okay, to its environment. Uh, so something to do with nature, the world, you know, the, the cre you know, created order. Some would use uh, the, the phrase creation, of course, and means something entirely different 
uh, than what you and I would mean. But there, again, there's some ecological element typically. There's always an economical element that usually focuses on egalitarian uh, thinking, egalitarian distribution, so that everyone out there is just free from need. Uh, again, we're going to talk about how this is spun and then sort of what the reality always turns out to be. But as, you, as we go through these, I want you to be thinking, well, you know, who in their right mind would oppose any of this? Well, you know, in, in principle, sure, we'd like, you know, we're not in favor of, hey, you know, who, who all out there wants to rape the environment and pillage natural resources? I mean, nobody's going to say, yeah, I, let, let's go at that. And, you know, we don't, we wouldn't say, well, my optimal view of things would be that lots of people don't have enough to eat. You know, so there we go. I mean, nobody's going to say something like that. So it's easy to sort of float the idea, but then where the rubber meets the road is, is always, well, what exactly does that mean and how is it accomplished? Other elements, political, again, this ambition for world peace. Again, who, who would want world war or lots of war? Freedom from crime, you know, again, these are all desirable things. The, the key is going to be, though, again, how do we define what's a crime and what isn't? Uh, what's criminalized and what isn't? And then how do we bring this to pass? Uh, what are the enforcement mechanisms? And who's the target? Okay. So there's this political idea. And then there's an equality idea, equal rights, multiculturalism, and, of course, gender neutrality. Uh, in our day especially, is a big element of this. And again, these, these things are usually cast or put opposite things like racism and uh, male domination, you know, defined again as, you know, something, a situation where, you know, earlier in our history, women couldn't own property, you know, in the 17th, 18th century, even into the 19th century, didn't have control of their children in a divorce, you know, it was all, you know, male favored. So all these things that we, you know, we'd look at now and say, well, you know, that, that really wasn't a good idea. So, yeah, sign me up for that, okay? Again, there's, there's a way that it's marketed, but there's going to be a reality to it that doesn't quite conform to the marketing. Progress is a big element, this idea of human improvement. And that can mean improvement of life, you know, quality of life issues. But in our day and age, it often means improvement of the organism, okay, in various ways that Again, some of which we would certainly buy into medically. But, you know, again, as I'm going to mention in the, in the next session, part two, this drifts into other areas that are kind of icky. Okay, kind of, you know, things that, you know, probably wouldn't want to go down that road because who knows where that's going to end you know, and how that's going to go. Science and technology, of course, are always a part of this idea of progress. Then there's a religious element, and this has historically taken three forms, one of three forms. You either have utopian communities that are anti-religious, and that is, you know, science and nature kind of rule the day. Uh, nature, in effect, is really the substitute divinity. Then you have omni-religious utopianism, where that's basically all religions blend into one, either the effort to create some sort of unified religion or it's in effect, a free-for-all. And, of course, that creates the condition that if you ever raise your hand and object to anything, then you're in the way. Okay, then you're, 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 uh, you're an obstacle to the utopian idea. And you have also had Christian uh, utopias, uh, historically. And some of these, you know, drift into, you know, some wacky areas of theology. But others are, 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 are more uh, communal-centered, and their theology is more or less... Uh, what we would define as orthodox, but it, it really had to do with a lifestyle. So there, there's some variation here. Examples of these elements in practice, again, there, there are political utopias where, again, has nothing to do with any sort of religious impulse. There are some Christian utopias historically, and then there are what I, what I would term pseudo-Christian, either things that sort of pass themselves off as Christian but are theologically aberrant. So you get all different kinds. In the ancient world, Genesis 2 describes a utopia. That would, would be the one I would vote for, uh, the, the good one. 
but it's again an ideal state. It's the Edenic state. So that is part of biblical theology. Outside that though, probably what, what scholars would point to as sort of the earliest uh, utopian idea would be Plato's Republic. And you know, as we read this in the 21st century, there are things in there that would sort of make us recoil like, well, that, that can't be a good idea. But for Plato's day, uh, it was really revolutionary, you know, the ideas that he, he communicated in here about an ideal society. Augustine with the city of God. Again, Augustine's trying to argue that the, the world state is not the primary ideal, but again, this, this city of God as he defined it. Uh, Christian community, you know, ruled by God, so on and so forth. And regardless of what you think about Augustine, you know, his, what he, a lot of what he says in here could be, could, you know, could fall into the sort of innocuous or theologically abstract uh, category. But a lot of his thinking was used later to legitimize the Crusades, for instance. We have to bring in the kingdom. We have to make the, the world, our part of the world, we have to make it Christian. We have to make it the kingdom of God. And so that didn't end really well. <laughs> Uh, so it, it, it's an example, again, of, uh, you know, we, real, we realize that the, the papacy, of course, is motivating a lot of the Crusades, and it was largely political, but again, it was sort of baptized, you know, using the ideas of Augustine and others, and it just went off in a, in a misguided direction. And I, I would say in many ways it was misguided from the beginning. 16th century, Calvin's Geneva. Uh, I know some of you might be John Calvin fans. And not to take away from Calvin's genius, you know, because, you know, he wrote the Institutes when he was 29 years old, didn't have things like concordances and Bible software and stuff like that. So the guy obviously has a lot going on upstairs. But the problem is, if you actually look at Calvin's Geneva, you probably wouldn't want to move there. <laughs> I mean, he's throwing people in jail for referring to him as Mr. instead of Master. Uh, someone smiles at a baptism, and so that's, that's prison time. And there are all sorts of things that if you read through the history of Calvin's Geneva, it, it, it had the feel of, a, of an attempted utopia, a theocratic state, run, of course, by Calvin. Um, so, you know, there would be some things there that would make us uncomfortable. If, if you were living in Calvin's Geneva, you had better be a Calvinist, for instance. <laughs> Or it just isn't going to turn out very well. Uh, Thomas More, Utopia. This is where, where you know, the, the, the term really entered uh, the, the regular discourse uh, with More's uh, book. You know, More, again, is, is casting this imaginary idea, you know, in part as a, as a critique you know, for what he saw politically going on around him. But all, all of these literary attempts, you know, I, th I think, are worth reading because on the one hand, they show you what the person's thinking, and boy, wouldn't that be wonderful, and then you turn the page and, and you get into enforcement. Uh, all of them require power. They require power structures to make this work. Because guess what? People are not robots. And no matter how good you make it sound, at some point there's going to be dissent. So what do you do with dissent? Well, we can't have dissent because this is utopia. You know, we have to eliminate that. 17th century, we get Thomas Hobbes with his famous book, Leviathan. Again, and this is the book that really focuses on the empowerment, uh, the power situation of the state uh, over people, again, to enforce this sort of perceived ideal community. Francis Bacon, uh, The New Atlantis, is really an important book. Uh, this one has a, a, a significant influence in uh, the United States and America. Uh, because, again, there were many, and it wasn't, you know, you didn't have to be sort of a dyed-in-the-wool Freemason to, to think this way, but there were many, you know, who would have been outside uh, Freemasonry and just sort of in the in Enlightenment discourse that would have looked at America as the new Atlantis. Uh, again, this is the new utopia. We come here to get away from monarchy to get away from the social ills that we see in Europe. And we get to basically start over. And, and we get to reimagine uh, what communal life should be, what, what the ideal state would be. And you know, 
when, when Bacon writes New Atlantis about this imaginary place somewhere else, you know, outside of Europe, that uh, people go to and, and really start this thing called civilization over again. When people, you know, when America is discovered, of course, by Bacon's time it was known. But when people start to migrate in serious numbers to North America, this is what they're thinking. You know, this is the new Atlantis. We, you know, this is the, the great country, the wonderful, you know, country where we get to actually conduct these experiments, you know, in, in you know, reimagining what, what life should be like, what the state should be like. 18th century, the Shakers, uh, I'm from the East Coast, I'm from Pennsylvania originally, and grew up near the Shaker uh, area, the Shaker community, and the Ephrata Cloister. In fact, my first daughter was born in Ephrata, not at the Cloister. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the Shakers were a, a, a Christian uh, community, and so, so was the, the Ephrata Cloister, but again, Christian uh, again, there, there would be some things going on there that you, you would sort of r would raise an eyebrow or you might not recognize as Christian. But again, ostensibly, uh, they were not um, atheists, certainly. They were not secularists. You know, they're, they're trying to do Christian things. Uh, they tend to be very uh, strict in terms of celibacy. The, 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 I, think the, I don't think there are any shakers left anymore. Again, part, celibacy, celibacy was part of the problem there. I, I think the last Shaker died like in the 1990s or something like that. I mean, you can still go see the, uh, the community and then, of course, the cloister. The cloister has more connections with uh, transcendentalism and, you know, some of the, the uh, quasi or, or overtly kinds of occult things later on in its history. But it, again, it, it, it's not exactly where it began. Uh, so you have, again, these sorts of early attempts at let's go over, we create our own community, we, have, we share our own goods in common, uh, we have our own rules for the community, that sort of thing. We, we, we separate ourselves, we isolate ourselves from the mainstream way of doing things. The Enlightenment contributes a lot to, again, the utopian thinking. Uh, the Enlightenment, of course, terribly important. Again, the age and elevation of reason, human reason. Well, if you're in Europe and, you know, again, you've, you've been living with centuries of monarchy and, and you don't like aristocracy and you see all the abuses there, the, the real, you know, strict division of classes and, and economic states and uh, you think, boy, we ought to be able to do this better. You know, that, that uh, we ought to be able to think for ourselves and we ought to have checks and balances in our government. We ought to have power divided among many. And all these political ideas we're familiar with that actually are sort of launched in the Enlightenment. Well, they launch movements. Uh, of course, we have the American Revolution, which I have listed second here, but chronologically it preceded uh, the French Revolution. The American Revolution was you know, a, a violent reg revolution, but uh, as far as the transition of power, and the establishment of power within the, the community. You know, we had you know, peaceful transitions you know, from presidency to presidency and so on and so forth. This is why after Washington left office, uh, pe people were really nervous. Is, is this actually going to work? Uh, a, you know, it, it was a big deal that he stepped down after two terms. And that, that established the two-term tradition. It was not written into the Constitution initially. That had to come with an amendment. but. Uh, when you had the transition to a new leader and the election was really close, like a couple electoral votes, you know, is, there, is this going to erupt into chaos and that sort of thing? And it, and it, and it didn't. Now, the French Revolution is, is quite a different story. You know, what's going on over there? It, it was a, uh, on the one hand, we had a guy like Thomas Jefferson over here who was a Francophile. Everybody knows that. Uh, and he was on the, 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 he thought the revolution was great in France until, you know, this isn't like the internet where you get instant information about what's really going on over there. So gradually he, he starts hearing about, you know, children being guillotined and stuff like this and Robespierre and all this. And he's like, well, boy, that, that's just not really a good thing. <laughs> I mean, so eventually, you know, he, it becomes distasteful even to somebody like Jefferson who was like all things France. Uh, but again, both of these things, even though they sort of worked differently and took divergent paths, uh, were fueled by the Enlightenment, Enlightenment ideas, again, of, of building the ideal, the, 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 the ideal state.
where everything's fair, everybody has enough, that sort of thing. 19th century, again, we get Second Great Awakening. Now, I think actually this contributes to utopianism as well because of the rise of post-millennial thinking. <clears throat> and that is we need to bring in the kingdom so that Jesus can come back. That's what post-millennialism is. Now, post-millennialism in the 19th century was a big deal because, again, you know, we have this, it, 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 it's hand in glove or it works in tandem with populism. Because of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century uh, and the way that industrial revolutions typically work is that wealth and, of course, with it, uh, power and political influence um, comes into the hands of a few, again, in the merchant class. We're, we're, I'm thinking of people like J.P. Morgan, okay, Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie. This is, this is the era for that. And again, I'm not saying that everything these guys did was, was bad because it wasn't. Uh, a guy like Carnegie you know, felt that it was, it, was, it was just immoral to pass on your wealth. So that's why he decided to give it all away. Um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, you know, not everybody felt the same way as Carnegie. Carnegie, of course, wasn't perfect uh, himself. You know, he had the problem with Homestead and all that. But because wealth is so hev highly concentrated in the hands of a few, and you get this real disparity between the wealthy elite and then the worker, okay, that creates problems across the board economically for most of the population. So it's a serious thing. And one of those that, that really suffered were the farmers uh, because people were moving from the rural parts of the country into the cities because of urbanization. Again, everything's becoming mechanized. You get factories, the whole factory system, the assembly line idea. The demographics in the country are changing dramatically. And the farmers are hurt by that, and they're also hurt by the fact that the money supply is controlled by a very few people. So to get low, I mean, there are instances in, in the 19th century where you can read that lenders were charging 300% on a bank loan, you know, stuff like that. And farmers need capital to buy land, they need to buy machinery, so they're just getting killed. Um, that all factors into the rise of the populist movement, which is a grassroots movement where, again, we, you know, as, as farmers unite, you know, we, united labor, the farm industry, but then that becomes an appeal because right down here you have transcendentalism going on at the same time. This, this sort of utopian idea of, of wonderful, harmonious coexistence with the land, again, with nature. And so you, you, you have in populism, again, these, these sort of murky ideas of, of the rise of the masses to create this wonderful, harmonious you know, state. We want equality. We don't want this to classes and social classes and economic classes and again we're the farmers we're the ones that are close to the land we get our hands dirty and you know we ought to be you know doing sustainable th all this rhetoric was in, in place in the 19th century and so that gets married to this idea of hey you know if we can pull this off then Jesus can come back or Jesus will come back you had post-millennialism as a as an eschatological system develop during this time and it actually led to very utopian thinking within the church. William Jennings Bryan is probably the best example. Uh, ran for president, I don't know how many times. He never won. Uh, obviously, probably more famous for the Scopes trial uh, later on. But again, he was a significant figure in this whole era. Uh, Charles Finney, okay? again, post-millennial thinking. This, it was a big deal. Transcendentalism, I've mentioned, again, Walden Pond, Henry David Thoreau, the Alcotts, Walt Whitman, all these people. This was a more, and I'll, I'll use the term, pagan approach. And what I mean by pagan is, paganism is, at, at heart is about uh, worship of the earth. You know, it, it's about this, this, this swap out for a personal transcendent deity. Uh, we're we're going to do away with that, and we're going to view nature as our divinity, as, as our divine focus. Uh, it's very monistic. I'll be talking about monism a lot uh, later this afternoon in part two. The idea that everything is one. 
you know, nature is God, God is nature, everything that is unified, all this, it, it's the Oprah theology, you know, of today. So, I mean, it, it, all of this talk that we associate with the New Age movement and Oprah and all that sort of thing is transcendentalism, you know, plus a few other threads, too. You know, it, it, it's nothing new. But there were three communities that were deliberately started in this country that were transcendental utopian communities. Again, it was all about harmony with nature and, and, and the ecosystems and all that stuff. Marxism, of course, 19th century, a, an economic theory, again, really aimed at, you know, quote unquote, uh, leveling the, the, the playing field economically and getting rid of all these you know, class divisions and class warfare to start revolutions to bring in what? A better society, a more, e you know, egalitarian, equal society. It's an inherently utopian idea. Uh, you know, again, an economic theory that, of course, takes different forms politically. Edward Bellamy, uh, this is a, he was a novelist, looking backward. Uh, he, again, he, he, it's just a famous work describing a, a utopian community that looks a lot like, you know, he imagined himself to be in the year, I think it was 2000, and he's writing in the 19th century. And so, again, he, he's, he's creating this vision for this ideal community, some of which, some of it would, would look, you know, oddly like what we're looking at right now. Uh, again, with, with some of the, again, the control mechanisms and the way things are. But it was a very influential book at the time. 20th century, we get progressivism. We've all heard a lot about that recently. Again, the idea of human progress, all these utopian ideas, it's the same old stuff. Uh, of course, with progressivism and H.G. Wells, uh, with his works, Modern Utopia, Men Like Gods, The Shape of Things to Come, again, utopian ideas. And progressivism and H.G. Wells, of course, a lot of, a lot of their thinking was influenced by eugenics. Okay, again, you, to create the ideal society, you need ideal people, right? You know, you need to sort of weed out the, the, the unfortunate or less desirable uh, elements uh, to the human population. So that was very common in the United States. A lot of, a lot of later Nazi eugenic theory and practice uh, were, was drawn from uh, American and British writing. And there was the, that was, those were the seed beds to, to some of those things that would, would come later on. Marxist Leninism, of course, this would be the Lenin experiment with Marxism, of course, the revolution of 1917. You know, again, the working class. We're going to create the community where the worker is in power. Uh, you know, I mean, we know how that worked. But again, ostensibly, this is how it's, it's marketed. This is how it, it's, it, you know, it's put forth. Huxley's Brave New World. Uh, was a was a critique, and some would say a parody of H.G. Wells's uh, utopian visions. Because if you've ever read Brave New World, it, it's sort of the, you know, the world without pain, really the the world without uh, uh, any sort of trouble. It, it, it's a utopian vision, but because of some of the stuff in there, you know, what you need to do with people and to people to accomplish this, it, it's very dystopian. It's very you know scary. I don't know if you've ever read Brave New World, but I, I do recommend it. Uh, National Socialism, again, Nazism, again, used a lot of utopian thinking, the utopian techniques, you know, utopian goals. They tied race to it, you know, specifically in certain ways. There were certain occult threads that drove their view of the different races. Again, all of these things have, have more than one thread, but they're all attempts at creating the perfect state. And of course, the perfect state is always in the mind and the eye of the power holder, okay? <laughs> the one who gets to define all that. Uh, communism, another example. George Orwell, again, Animal Farm in 1984 are obviously critiques of, of this. Uh, 1984, one of the scarier books I've ever read. Uh, if you've not read 1984, well, I was going to say I recommend it, but in this day and age, maybe not. <laughs> It, it, it might put you out on the ledge. <laughs> Somebody would have to talk you off the ledge. A lot, of, a lot of 1984, you, you could see, man, you could just implement this really with a snap of your fingers today. But 1984 is, is really you know, frightening. And Animal Farm is, is in its own way as well. Uh, it, 
again, I, I recommend both of those. Atlas Shrugged is also a utopian uh, element, even though that's popular with a lot of conservatives. If you've read Atlas Shrugged, and you know, I enjoyed the novel, but I recognize that the author is an atheist, and a lot of her, Ayn Rand's um, thinking is certainly contrary to good theology. It's an entertaining read, even though it's a thousand pages long. It's very clever. But Galt's Gulch is a perfectly utopian community. Okay? If you've ever read the book, you, you know that. Uh, hippie movement, the 1960s, again, bringing in the age of Aquarius, where we, you know, everybody's equal and there's no war and all this stuff. Again, the, the themes are familiar. Of course, the American left, as we know it, grew out of that. And you also have right-wing religious cults. You know, that they're, again, it just, it, it's utopianism, but just from a different trajectory, a different angle. So, again, none of this is really news, but I wanted to show you some examples anyway, just to sort of put it in your mind of what I'm talking about. Let's talk about what's really behind it. Now, the utopian impulse, again, pre-20th century, again, this is how it's sold, this column over here. And really, the, the modern reality as we've experienced it in the 20th century, and as I believe we will keep on experiencing it in the 21st century. So over here, here's how it's sold. Here's the marketing. Oh, sustainability, shared resources, plenty for everybody, freedom from need. And of course, over here, that means that food is under state control. <laughs> That's the only way you can accomplish this today. Okay, you have to have the food supply under control. And that means, and it explains why, and I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping a lot of you are aware of this. If you want the, the, the copy of the slides, by the way, so that you can get to this link, uh, I'm not, we're not connected to the internet here, but that link will show you, I think, you know, half a dozen, you know, seven, eight, ten ways that already uh, the food supply is being really controlled. And, you know, things as simple as, you know, the, the, the family farm are being defined in such a way that they're being criminalized. Okay, this is not accidental. Uh, it, it's not that... The, the, you know, I, I'm, I'm still willing to say, I, I realize there are a few people who absolutely know, know what they're doing here. But there are a lot of, you know, legislat legislators that are frankly clueless in, in a whole number of areas. And so they think that, you know, oh, I'm doing a good thing by voting yes for this because we don't want people to get sick in a, in a, you know, on this farm where, you know, things are, are not controlled and there's no FDA and all that. I mean, they think they're doing the right thing when what they're really doing is, is they're putting structures in place that will disallow anyone the right to feed themselves. Again, it, will, it, it, it puts food under state control. Uh, there's a movie called Farmageddon, yeah. a documentary. Again, that one you might have to be talked in off the ledge, okay, <laughs> after, after you, you watch that. But again, it, it, it's this sort of thing. Again, what, what's happening legislatively? But you have to have this to make this work today. So, you know, food, of course, the Henry Kissinger quote that food is a weapon, of course, is sort of famous and, or infamous because we've actually done this, you know, in the, in the Korea and the Vietnam, you know, situations where part of the strategy was to keep the populations from getting food. I mean, that was just a tactic. So there's population control, there's deliberate shortages, of course, if you would control the food, su food supply, you can put additives in there. Uh, you might also want to want to watch a film called, um, let me see if I can remember, I can see the cover here in my head, Demographic Winter. Okay, it is an absolute utter myth that the population is growing too large. The reverse is actually true. And again, this is me. This is Mike Heiser. This is Mike stick in the mud Heiser, okay? I am not given to exaggeration. I don't do my research on Billy Bob's website, okay? I do peer-reviewed stuff. And you watch Demographic Winter. They're real scholars. They're real specialists in the fields. And it's very easy to document that we in the West are undergoing a dramatic demographic shift just by, it, it's just a numbers game. That's why it's called demographic winter. Europe does not have the birth rates to sustain its population. 
we are right on the edge. There are five or six European countries that are actually under the, the demographic number required to sustain its own population. Now, the only, the only communities that, that aren't conforming to that within Europe and within the U.S. and in other parts of the world are, are the, uh, the, the Muslims are the big ones because they, it, it's, it's part of their, it's both part of their religion and part of their political outlook to have big families. In the West, in, you know, because we're civilized, and we have things like abortion. By the way, demographic winter is the hidden cost of abortion. The victimless crime, it is the hidden cost of abortion. Uh, and, and the people in the, in the documentary actually go through that. You know, how, how abortion has led to this situation where we cannot sustain our population. So, you know, it, it gets into all sorts of stuff like that, but, but there are these shifts going on. And part of that, the reason that, that made me mentally rabbit trail, is this additive thing. Again, there, there have been situations where it has been at least suggested, and you know, we can talk again whether you know, small c, big c, conspiracy kind of stuff, whether it's actually been implemented. Again, that, that's the controversial part. But the, the non-controversial part is that it's been talked about and could be done, is you put additives in the feud to kill off or, or to decrease uh, the, uh, the sperm supply. Okay, essentially, and that reduces, again, the population. Eugenicists are very open that we need lots and lots of people to die off, to have, you know, again, to, to have sustainability. And rather than just sort of advocating, hey, we need a few world wars in succession, that'll take care of the problem. Rather than do something like that, it's demographic control that is, is just far more convenient and effective and frankly marketable. So again, I recommend, again, Farmageddon, Demographic Winter. There's actually two. There's, Demographic Winter has a sequel to it, too. Uh, it's not exciting. It's kind of chilling, but it, you know, it, it's good stuff. It's real, you know, it's real scholarship. Political manipulation. Again, if you control the food supply, well, then it's kind of easy to get people to do what you want them to do. Would you, would you like to obey okay, or not eat? I'll wait for your answer. <laughs> you know, it, it's not difficult to imagine. And again, you know, we have regulations that are, are keeping people, again, from growing their own food just by zoning regulations. You don't really, really realize the power of regulation. It's invisible. You know, it, it's not overt. It's not, you know, in your face, you know, we're, we're, we're manipulating you. But, you know, who, who wants to go to zoning hearings and stuff like this? You know, I mean, it's just boring. Like, I have a life to live. I'm not going to get involved in that. Are you kidding? You know, I, I don't know if I could even stay conscious. But, you know, while, while, you're, while we're thinking that, it's just happening. Again, it's just this invisible laying, laying in place of structures that are going to be uh, called upon as precedent later, you know, for certain things. So we'll move on. Ecological, again, here's how it's sold, you know, the harmony with nature, so on and so forth. God is in all the world. That's panentheism as opposed to God is nature. God is the world, pantheism. Environmentalism. Well, what you get is you get neo-paganism as civil religion, as the, as the secular cultural religion. Again, emphasizing the wonder of nature the transcendence, think, think about the vocabulary I'm using here because I'm using it deliberately. The transcendence of nature. I just get warm fuzzies, you know, thinking about that. But this is what they're talking about, you know, the idea of, of an eternal consciousness, you know, consciousness studies, spirituality, so on and so forth. These things are not new. You also get, in some quarters, scientific materialism as the civil religion. Uh, again, fueled by atheistic natural selection, which when combined with social Darwinism, again, applying principles of natural selection, survival of the fittest to the way society operates, uh, to, to classes and class structures. Uh, and of course, eugenics is part of that. Nowadays, of course, we refer to eugenics as genetic engineering and genetic selection. Okay. Genetics is just the new eugenics. Uh, and again, that's not to say, I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to demonize all genetic research, because that would just be ridiculous too. But once you have the power of the genome in your hand, 
eugenics is like really easy. <laughs> you know, it, it's just it's just how do we how do we accomplish this thing we can easily do now on a wide scale? That, that's the only question you need to ask. Politically, of course, world peace, freedom from crime. Who in their right mind would oppose that? Well, I'm not opposed to that. I am opposed to statist fiefdoms that are, if you're a statist, you are anti-individual. Okay, think about that. So that means if you're in control, you get to criminalize practically anything. You know, criminalize self-protection. That would be like gun laws, taking guns away. Okay, we're going to criminalize your ability to protect yourself. Well, <laughs> why? Because your emphasis is on the state, okay, the utopia, as opposed to the individual. Citizen self-sustenance, we talked about that with the food supply. There's always, you know, you, you have each individual state, you know, state being defined as country here, you know, trying to implement their view of perfection here, their view of, of the ideal situation. But ultimately, you know, you have a push toward global government. And there's lots, this link right in, in particular here, again, doesn't lead to, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, a private researcher or something like that, that link will actually lead to uh, an official federal government watchdog entity, you know, like an official media group. It, it's run through the Heritage Foundation, in fact. So there are people, again, even within groups that, that you know, the wider culture would recognize as credible, actually keeping their eye on global governance because they know that it's real. There are really people, lots of people, who want that and since the Heritage Foundation, again, is, is focused on principles of individual liberty, they don't want that. <laughs> so they're, you know, they're, they're keeping their eye, and it's a, it's a nice site because it's sort of a, a gateway or a clearinghouse for lots of information that, that's official, you know, official documents on global governments be, because they collect that stuff and post it on the site. You, of course, the UN which is inherently anti-national, it's inherently global, uh, and Agenda 21, which I, I don't think we need to really comment any further on, because we, we sort of all know what that is, but all of these organizations, again, trying to push toward a global state, okay, as opposed to, again, individual national states. Equality, of course, equal rights, multiculturalism, gender neutrality, don't you, you Christians are nuts. Don't you want women to vote and all this? You want to go back to the 18th? Again, this is how it's marketed. This is how you're forced into sort of you know, intellectual compliance. But the modern reality is that opposing views on any of these ideas or and anything related to them are marginalized. And in ca some cases, there's an effort to criminalize uh, any sort of opposition view. There's an inversion of sexual norms. Basically, nothing is aberrant anymore because we can all just say it's biology. Again, and we can say that because we, we now have nature as our God or scientific materialism as our God. So we have perfectly consistent theology you know, by saying, hey, it's just biological. Everything is biological. And of course, if you disagree, then there must be something wrong with you. That's a psychosis. Okay? <laughs> Uh, it, 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 it is funny, but it, it's really not funny because, again, if you, if you look in, in some of the, the scientific literature, especially in psychiatry, they're defining, you know, your resistance to what appears to everyone else as normal and good, that's a psychosis. Okay? Try to get health care, <laughs> you know. And, that, and that's just the beginning of what can, of how you can be manipulated and, and pushed into whatever direction. Um, so it, it's a serious thing. Of course, nationalist culture is going to be, you know, vilified because we, we need to be multicultural. We need to be global. And so any, any sense of, of individual sovereignty, of course, as we saw, is, is like, well, what's up with that? And, and naturally, any sense of national sovereignty is going to be viewed as either aberrant or oppositional to, to, to the good that the global state could bring. Right. 
religion. Again, we, we saw earlier that we have some that are anti-religious, omni-religious, or Christian. Of course, anti-religious in our day and age, we have really, we've really seen the, the, the rise of what I would call militant atheism as opposed to, you know, to, to nice atheists. You have, you have a lot more militant atheists, again, and they're actually viewed as more reasonable and more tolerant. Tolerant is a big buzzword. More tolerant than a lot of Christians. Why? Because the militant atheist will agree with the, you know, the gender neutrality thing, it's all biologic, you know, all, all this stuff, uh, you know, scientific materialism as you know, the substitute for God, they're, they're gonna agree with a lot of these things. And so they're, they actually are marketed or market themselves or are marketed as more reasonable than these you know, stodgy old Christians. Omni-religious, of course, paganism, again, being defined as the, the elevation of, uh, of nature to the status of deity. Paganism, the scientification, if that's a word, of the supernatural. Now think about that. You know, I don't know how many of you are into things like, you know, uh, quantum physics and, you know, chaos theory and, and that sort of thing. I, I, I dabble in a lot of that stuff. I'm by no means an expert in it. But one of the things that, that you're seeing is basically using and things like chaos theory and quantum theory do not of necessity drive the conclusion that there is no immaterial reality. I know lots of physicists personally that understand quantum theory very well. And they're Christians, they're, and they're serious Christians. They don't, they don't think it requires a substitute for the, for the truly non-material, what we would, I don't like the term supernatural for this reason because it has the word natural in it. Um, but they, it's not a necessary conclusion. However, there are lots of people who will use the quote unquote new physics to basically attach a natural explanation to everything you thought was supernatural, everything you thought was immaterial. And if it's all material in some sense, then it's all natural. It's nature. Here we are back again. Intellectually, we complete the cycle to substituting nature, the created world, for the creator, blending them. That's what monism is. Okay? Monism, again, the idea that everything is one and one is everything and all that stuff. There's no creator crea creation distinction. Okay, you deny that if you're a monist. So, you know, we have this going on religiously. And of course, anti-Christian basically, unless Christianity adapts to this, especially this in our day, and I'm gonna talk about this in the second session with not what I view as the new Gnosticism, um, it's gonna be criminalized and demonized. Progress, again, human improvement, science, technology, human control, is what this means in our day and age. So whereas we would call it progress, human improvement through science and technology, what it really means is control of people through science and technology. We have information control. In other words, we'll, we'll, we'll fill your head with what it needs to be filled with. Uh, knowledge, of course, is power. It's easy to propagandize things like the political process. Uh, eugenics, of course, that's progress because we're weeding out, you know, we're, we're clearing out the gene pool there. Uh, isn't that a good thing? Uh, police state, we have to have a police state to enforce progress. <laughs> Commerce, of course, comes under state control. I mean, basically everything you do, if it's viewed as being an impediment to progress, then it needs to be controlled or eliminated. Okay, one of the two. I mean, we have to be able to keep the progress going. We don't want progress to stop. Now, utopian impulse as a biblical perversion. And this is where your handout comes in. I'm going to go through this quickly, and I'll, I'll tell you what the handout supplements. Here are the fundamental myths of utopianism. The idea that humans are perfectible. Okay, that's a myth. You know, it either on an individual level or a corporate level, it ignores, you know, again, human capacity for evil. It, it, it ignores, you know, the condition of the heart. But it's a myth that drives utopianism. 
The other myth is that you can force human perfectibility. <laughs> uh, that just isn't going to work. So enforcing an Edetic state, in other words, it would be Eden by human effort. Eden created by a ruling human elite. Again, this is, this is just, this is mythology. So human utopias require total control and they are ultimately dystopias, the opposite of what they claim to be. I would say this is all contrary to a Genesis theological narrative. It's contrary to the meaning of the divine image. Of course, if you've read any of my stuff, you know what my views on the image are. The image is not a thing put in you. It's not a quality. It is a status. It's a status that utilizes the qualities we have as humans. But if you say the image is a quality, then I don't know why you're anti-abortion, okay, at least prior to brain formation, because you have no theological argument then. If the image of God is a qualitative ability, I'm sorry, but the single cell zygote after conception does not have any of that. So if that's your definition, you're in a lot of ethical deep water there. And it would be easy to you know, undermine your view of abortion. So my view is actually based on a, on a point of Hebrew grammar, which I won't get into here, but the image is a status. We are created as God's imagers. We are to be him, we are to represent him. That's on an individual basis. So inherent within the image idea is the idea of freedom, free will, and individuality. It just goes with the program. Okay? It reflects what God is. Evil and the shared image, again, there's a reason why the, there are plurals in, in Genesis. Again, because we are created in God's image, we have free will. It, free will is an absolute necessity because it is a communicable, a communicable attribute of God. If you were not free, if you could not make legitimate, moral, free will decisions, there is no way you could be like God. And that's the point of the image. You're like him. You would be a robot. God is not a robot. God doesn't share the attribute of robot ability. Okay? It's just nothing like that. It's essential. And so, again, we have this idea of being able to, to make a decision, that there's, there's freedom here. And of course, that also means you know, that we're going to have evil because people are going to choose poorly. Genesis also democratizes the image. Let us create humankind in our image. Okay? It's, it, that language in the ancient Near Eastern world is unique because the only people who represented God in the ancient Near Eastern world were who? The ruling elite, the kings. They were, this is why they were conceived, and I mean, I mean that metaphorically, they were considered to be either divine offspring or put in their positions by the gods. They were the gods' representatives. Genesis says, no, it isn't just for ruling elite, it's everybody. Everyone is an imager, every human being. And that's very contrary, again, to the utopian idea because, again, we have to have these power brokers. You always have to have an elite to enforce the utopia. Human imperfection and mortality, again, that is part and parcel of what we read in the Genesis uh, narrative. We are imperfect. We are mortal. We are less than God. We are not gods. Okay, there is no such thing as this perfectibility. The assumption of authority and sovereignty, again, we will be as gods, that whole, again, mis misguided idea. Again, if, if you look at what happens in Genesis 3, part of what the serpent says is true, that you know, when you do eat, your eyes will be opened and you will become as Elohim. That's what it says in the Hebrew. You will become as gods. It should be plural there because in verse 22, God says, well, the, the, the man and the woman have become as one of us. Okay. There, there's, there's the plurality there. The idea being that, look, now we have human beings who now have assumed sovereignty. Okay? Whereas God was in control before, and God had laid out his will and said, uh, okay, uh, there's this thing called Eden that you're living in, and wouldn't it be nice to stay here? Isn't this a wonderful place? You can stay here indefinitely. And you eat from the tree of life, you, you know, you're, gonna, you're not going to die. You're gonna, you have contingent immortality because I'm the only being that like, has immortality in and of itself. But you know, we'll set that aside. Wouldn't you like to stay here and live forever with me? 
you know, serve me and interact. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be great? So, you know, God has this plan for human authority, human shared rulership, you know, with him and, and other humans and other non-human beings as well in Eden. And that gets corrupted as soon as humankind presumes the right to dictate the terms and to propel the program. So, you know, we have that going on here. And then we have separation from Eden again. And this is really something, you know, absolutely against utopia. Now, your handout is a fuller description of this symbiotic relationship between the, the biblical view of the divine council, God and, and God ruling through his council on earth, the way things should have been, and then once the fall happens, you know, God's continued interaction with humanity, again, through himself and through his counsel. So what you have in those six pages, I've drawn excerpts from a, an article that I, I really, you know, like and would recommend. But they're excerpts that sort of trace the flow through the Bible of that idea. Okay, so that's what the handout is. Babel, again, is a big deal with this because if you understand what's going on at Babel, a ziggurat, Tower of Babel, was built to bring the divine to earth. Okay, we're going to build you a house. We're going to build you a home because gods live on mountains. So let's like build our own mountain so that the deity will come here. And then when he comes here, we can negotiate. You know, we can, we can kind of barter. It's the same logic of idolatry. Why do people, you know, the, the ancient person wasn't, wasn't an idiot. He knows that this thing he just made isn't his creator. So why do they make idols? Because they believe deities can be summoned to reside there. You locate the deity. This is why Israel was forbidden to make graven images, because Yahweh cannot be tamed. Yahweh will not be brought anywhere for negotiation. That's up to him. Okay, it's a completely different perspective on it. But you have the same thing going on with Babel. We are going to reestablish Eden. We are going to bring the deity back to earth. We're separated from the deity now. We got kicked out and all that stuff. We're going to bring the deity back down to earth, and then we're going to you know, do all this stuff, all this good stuff. Well, again, it's a usurpation of God's plan, God's punishment. You know, humans trying to remedy and re-kickstart what they ruined. Okay, Babel is sort of the, the beginning living illustration of this idea that, hey, let's bring heaven to earth. Again, utopian thinking. Heaven is not going to come to earth until God wills it and not before. But that's what the utopian misses or hates. <laughs> Take your pick. You know, one way or the other. So again, you know, how did we get here? I have to wrap up. We've got all these forces. Again, you can, I'll, I'll send you the slides unless you want to watch it on the video again. But we've got all these things going in our culture, you know, all the, these political movements, you know, out of, you know, what I call lemming capitalism here as opposed to philanthropic capitalism. All these things, and really what it comes down to, I like this one, checking our brains out at church. I think that's contributed. Mm -hmm. And checking the brain out of the pulpit, too. Uh, all these things have contributed to you know, the future. And here's what I think for sure we're going to be looking at. We're going to be seeing more decline, more status power, more emphasis of the state over the individual in this country. Technocracy, all these mechanisms used, again, to control information, to control behavior, to control the population. And we're going to see a further marginalization of what you know, we would look at as biblical Christianity. And I think the solution so this is not going to be popular. But this is the proven solution. And that is the church has to be willing to suffer in this generation for the next. Um, it worked the first time. There were 13 people who pulled this off. 12 apostles and Paul. Okay. They, they won. It worked but it came at a huge cost. So, you know, we, I, I understand we can look at our world and go, you know, what in the world are we going to do? I would suggest that we do what the apostles did. And that, that is not going to be easy. As Peter, Peter tells us point blank here. You know, Paul, do you think Paul knew what he was talking about? We felt that we had received the sentence of death, burden beyond our strength, you know, all this stuff, despair of life itself. 
But it, that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on the God who raises the dead. We thought we were dead, so we'll depend on the God who raises the dead. Okay, it's not a popular solution. It doesn't involve forming militia groups. Uh, it doesn't involve you know, taking the law into our own hands. But it is the tried and true method. It has worked in the past, and I would suggest it'll work again. It's just going to be a generational thing. <coughs> but we have to be willing to do that. So that is the end of the presentation. If you want to keep up with me, please follow me on Twitter. It's exciting, let me tell you. Uh, more importantly, if you want information about the facade, either the special edition or the sequel, please go to the site there, facadethebook.com. Sign up on the email list so that you get the alerts and the updates. And of course, my contact information is on my home page too. So. Do we have any time at all for questions? Probably not. We can cut it. All right. Well, thank you for coming again. Uh, part two of the continuing saga, <laughs> the post-Christian uh, future. Again, just like the, the first one, uh, if you've not watched the first one, I would recommend that. You don't have to have watched the first one for this one, but this is sort of a continuation a little bit of the thought experiment, but uh, I'm going to show you a few things in this one that are a little more um, concrete and I would say uh, definitely contemporary in terms of ideas that are currently in circulation uh, that we need to be aware of and we will ultimately need to think about. So the subtitle here is Pop Culture as High Priest of the Post-Christian Religious Worldview. So what I'm going to focus on is talking about the post-Christian culture, the post-Christian condition, and then sort of zero in on how, in the post-Christian world, what you're going to see as far as the morphing of Christianity. And, I, and I, I'm not saying that the morphing is going to be good. In fact, I'm, I'm suggesting that the morphing is not a good thing. And it's really going to morph into something that's actually very old. And we'll talk about that at that point. So this is going to be sort of, hey, here's what I think it's going to look like. And it's not really just opinion, because I'm going to show you what people are saying right now, OK, that the futurists, scholars in, in religious studies, scholars in pop culture, that sort of thing. And we will comment on it as we go. So by way of a sampling, what are the kinds of things futurists are talking about? Specifically, I'll start with this excerpt from something called the Center for Future Consciousness. Uh, the two people behind this website and this organization are the Lombardanos. And they have sort of a, a, a statement of purpose, statement of principles uh, for explaining what it is they do. And these are just a few of the comments. You'll notice that they're really oriented to this idea of gaining a holistic understanding of the present capacities and potential future evolution of consciousness and the human mind. Again, so there's what I want to plant in your minds right now is this whole idea of, of the human progression, human upward evolving, so to speak, and this theme of consciousness. Okay, these are going to. These are just going to be data points that we're going to return to. They're also interested in the future possibilities in science and technology that we're going to encounter, and of course, their impact on humanity in terms of this you know, upward evolution, and again, an evolutionary perspective on reality in the future. So this, the, 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 this center, the Lombardanos, again, are quite well known as far as you know, being futurists that you know, would be invited to conferences and write books and all this sort of stuff. And so this is what they're thinking about. Now, typically, and this is from one of the Lombardanos' uh, PowerPoint presentations, they're typically thinking of the future as some sort of techno-utopia where transhumanism is a big part of it. 
uh, technology obviously goes without saying, but again, they're, they're sort of vision casting, not just in terms of gadgetry, okay, but specifically in terms of a set of ideas that they feel are going to both dovetail with and derive from advancements in the sciences in particular. And as the sciences go, uh, religion is going to sort of be dragged along or morphed or transformed with it. And so there's a whole set of ideas there. And this is where I want to sort of orient for the rest of the time. Techno-utopian values, again, the, the, the usual suspects here. Progress, purposeful evolution, human power over nature, material or technological advancement as the key to success in the future world, all this sort of stuff. You know, freedom, of course, really uh, translates to don't give me any rules or any dogma uh, so I can be free. Happiness and hedonism, right in their presentation. The singularity is something we'll talk about momentarily, but I want to zero in on this document, a cosmist manifesto, okay? Right here, this one here. And here are the 10 points. I've abbreviated the annotations for the, the Cosmos Manifesto. But here are the 10 principles, 10 points. Humans will merge with technology to a rapidly increasing extent. It's a new phase of the evolution of our species. Now, you might be thinking cyborg here, okay, which, which is one th way to think about it. But if you know anything about nanotechnology, that's an invisible integration. That's something you never see. But it has the potential. Once you have, the, once you have control over the, every atom in your body, <laughs> I mean, you know, every, every molecule, you can change the human species as we know it. And this is going to be, and, and is now. I mean, you can buy whole, whole books on the ethics of nanotechnology. I mean, I've read a couple of them this year again to get my head into the, the sequel to the novel. And they're talking about things like elimination of disease, optimizing the human DNA uh, for its various potentials. And they're really ultimately talking about immortality because you're dying cell by cell. And every cell is made of molecules and you know that sort of thing. Well, if you can control and release nanobots into the body, so to speak, that instantly repair cellular loss, you have potential immortality, other than somebody you know, shooting you in the head or something like that. I mean, you get the idea. You will not age. You will not decline as a, as a physical specimen. So this is how it, it's going to be cast, but this is the sort of merging they're, they're talking about, too. It's not just what we would sort of think of as a cyborg. Uh, humans will develop sentient artificial intelligence and mind uploading technology. Now, this derives from, uh, and I don't want to go too far into this, but the, the current mind body, what, what even theologians and futurists and, and neuroscience, not neuroscientists call the mind body problem. That is, uh, are you your brain or are you and your brain separate? Um, well, if you are your brain, then if we, again, we can tap into the right places where the brain stores what you think you are, again, your internal thoughts, your memories, that sort of thing. And if that can be uploaded when we think into another body, but what if it's uploaded into a machine? You don't actually have a body anymore. This is the kind of things that, we're not talking, mean, this is in science fiction, but you'll actually read academic literature discussing this. It's not science fiction. Uh, in that sense. Uh, humans will spread to the stars and roam the universe, again, to meet and merge with other species out there. Won't that be wonderful? Humans will develop interoperable synthetic realities, again, virtual worlds able to support sentience, again, self-awareness. Um, some uploads will choose to live in virtual worlds. I mean, maybe I want to continue my life in this virtual world over here rather than, than this one. Uh, that's what they're talking about. Of course, then, you know, what the, the question of what is real becomes sort of blurred. Humans will develop space-time engineering and scientific future magic. 
beyond our current understanding and imagination. At, you know, translation, technology that does stuff we can't really even conceive of right now. Space-time engineering and future magic will permit achieving by scientific means most of the promises of religions. Oh, that's interesting. Many amazing things that no human religion ever dreamed. Eventually we'll be able to resurrect the dead by copying them to the future, or of course to some virtual reality, of which we can be a part. Wouldn't it be nice to sort of, you know, keep living with your, your loved ones, you know, with their what they are in terms of their, you know, brain synopsis firing in a virtual world forever. As long as somebody doesn't pull the plug, you know, it's kind of a problem. You kind of need the electricity there. <laughs> but, uh, intelligent life will become the main factor in the evolution of the cosmos, steering it toward an intended path. Technological advances will reduce material scarcity drastically, of course. Of course, everyone will have all that they need, of course. We talked about that the last time with utopianism. New ethical systems will emerge, well, I guess so, based on principles including the spread of joy, growth, and freedom through the universe. And 10, all these changes will fundamentally improve, fundamentally improve the subjective and social experience of humans and our creations and successors. Again. Yeah, this is the points of the Cosmist Manifesto. Now, let's say that a lot of that stuff just sort of takes off and becomes reality. Uh, a lot of it, uh, in, in fact, I would be willing to say all of it is in some form on the table now and either being planned or in some cases the, the initial starting points for, for it is, are already implemented. In other words, we're on these paths already. And again, I'm not talking about science fiction writers. I'm not talking about wacky Christians that just, you know, are sort of, you know, conspiracy minded and all. I'm talking about people who don't really give a, you know, a rip about religion or anything like this that are working in these fields. And this is the future they see. This is the future they envision. This is the future they, they're working toward. They're IBMers, okay, you know, the commercials and all that stuff. Uh, this is why they got the job and went to graduate school, because they want to do this stuff uh, for whatever you know, set of reasons. So what happens if this trajectory keeps running? What happens to Christianity? Well, again, what I'm going to show you here is, is, is how I think Christianity will, will begin to ape or adapt itself to this future. And again, I'm not saying this is a good thing. We, we all know already, this isn't news to anybody, that, that church as we know it is already this self-adapting thing to the trends of the world. Okay, we, we already know that. So what might we see more of and might see develop? Well, I think God will will become spoken of as an eternal divinity. Well, that's kind of nice. You know, God's eternal, isn't he? Sure. God is and always was. He is eternal consciousness. And in some respect, we would say that now. But again, moving Christianity, either, either keeping it the way it is in terms of the biblical text, biblical Christianity, retaining that or destroying it, is a matter of controlling the vocabulary. It is not difficult. If you control the vocabulary, you win the day. Right? All it takes is the implementation of mass media, or, which, which what I really mean by that is repeating it often enough to enough people, that thinking shifts. It's not difficult. This is, this is as simple as you can make it. It's just a logistic issue, okay? So God is and always was. He's eternal consciousness. We have monism instead of dualistic theism. Uh, monism, again, is the idea that, that everything is one, all is one. Dualism, which biblical theology requires, is a firm separation between creator and creation. So material reality, material matter at the quantum level, 
convinces us that materialism is an illusion. Now you have physicists already saying this because of the way they apply quantum physics. Well, think about that. If materialism, if matter is an illusion, and I realize you're, you're, your minds are already probing the inconsistencies of that statement. Just hang with me. If matter is an illusion, well, then isn't everything God anyway? If God is the only uncreated thing, the only thing that's not matter, and if matter is an illusion, then why don't we affirm monism? Doesn't it make sense? Doesn't monism make sense? It, it's still God. God's still eternal. Why is that a problem? Again, you control the vocabulary. Quantum physics, again, this whole idea. This is from Paul Davies, who's, of course, a well-known physicist. And he talks about quantum theory here. The old assumption that the microscopic world of atoms was simply a scaled-down version of the everyday world had to be abandoned. Newton's deterministic machine was replaced by a shadowy and paradoxical conjunction of waves and particles governed by the laws of chance rather than the rigid rules of causality. This is physics today, and it, it, it's, it's the reality of physics today. Now, for biblical theologians, they, the, the question becomes a simple one. Well, you know, maybe this does reflect God in some way. Maybe, maybe God made it this way and we just didn't understand it. Okay, that's different than redefining God okay, by virtue of what you're, you're, you're looking at. So, again, when you go down to the smallest, 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 smallest level, and, you know, we realize, even in this, this is made of atoms, and atoms are jumping around all over the place, and quantum theory says none of that behavior is predictable, so that this thing we call matter is just completely chaotic, completely random, you know, it, it, it creates illusions of real things for us. You know, if this is what we're talking about, then matter's an illusion anyway. So every, isn't everything God then? Isn't it all divine? So we have this eternal divinity idea. We would also have an eternal humanity uh, element to our you know, Christian theology in the post-Christian context. You know, you could say things like our soul and our mind and our body is a totality. And that's the Hebrew view, don't you know? Eternal consciousness can't be located. You know, it doesn't have... It's not limited spatially. It's, it, it's everything, and it's everywhere. Again, this is quantum physics applied to the human body, the human mind, the human soul. We are all part of the same undefined, unlimited thing that we would call God. We're all one. Transpersonal psychology is part of this. And for those of you not familiar with that term, this discipline studies the transpersonal or self-transcendent or spiritual aspects of the human experience, basically trying to psychologize spiritual experience, spiritual belief, that kind of thing. Transpersonal experiences may be defined as experiences in which the sense of identity or self extends beyond, that's the trans part, extends beyond the individual or personal to encompass wider aspects of humankind, life, psyche, or cosmos. Again, trying to take all of our religious experience, all of our religious ideas, all our thought life, and reducing that, psychologizing that, which means you link it to something in the brain which has evolved, okay? And since matter is immaterial anyway and is sort of an illusion, you know, we're just we're just a reflection of, of everything else that is, which is God. It's a nice theology so far. So we have God is real, okay, like that, but he's eternal consciousness now. All of creation is a reflection of God, consistent with modern science and the material world, and experiences that transcend material reality are just as real since consciousness is real. So therefore, prayer and premonition and prophecy, visions, providence, even transubstantiation, that idea from Catholicism, heaven, even hell, because those, those things are just stored in your memory banks. You know, they're, they're, they're a result of, of things you've heard and, and how your brain processes things. Reincarnation, ghost, deja vu, all of it is real. 
all of it is affirmed. It's, it's as real as, as this podium right here. But again, this podium is an illusion because we know that from quantum theory. And we're all just part of everything and everything is part of us. We're all God and God is all of us. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm getting a warm fuzzy right now. <laughs> um, hey, this will preach. See, there you go. This will <laughs> preach. Yeah, I, know it's, I know it sounds funny, but it's true. What does it cost you? Well, you lose the creator-creation distinction. That flies out the window. Yeah, God is very real, but he is not personal. He's not a personal entity. He's a thing. He's, he's everything, and everything is him. And, you know, there's, there's no individual entity that exists outside of creation anymore. And what's the distinction between God and man? Well, not much, really. Um, other trajectories. Divinized humanity. Now, we've already touched on this. And again, I'm not denying that uh, the future world will, will still not embrace biological determinism and Darwinism, you know, that, that sort of thinking. That's part of it. But what I am talking about are things like human enhancement and transhumanism. You, we, you know, we tend to think, oh, this is sort of ugly. You know, I, I, sure, humans you know, have lots of flaws, but I kind of like being human. You know? you know, what's wrong with that? You know, it has, has advantages, too. Well, if we go down these roads, we could argue that, hey, enhancing our species and transhumanism is the meaningful goal of our evolution. In fact, it's not only a meaningful path. But, you know, we're really, when we do this, we're acting like our, you know, our conception of God. Isn't, isn't God intelligent and creative? And you realize I'm talking about God as though he were a person and then denying it on the other, in the other breath. Because that's what you're going to hear. Okay. Again, you control the vocabulary. You know, genetic engineering is, that's a good thing. You know, genetic selection, hey, you know, you weed out the bad, you enhance the good. That, that's, you know, nanotechnology, nanomedicine. I mean, if, if we find out ways to, to sort of, you know, become immortal and, you know, if, and we like this life, that's fine. If we don't, well, we'll just inject ourselves into some virtual world. And we'll, you know, we all get to live forever anyway. But it'd be nice to be conscious of the fact that I'm living forever. I know I'm, I know I'm an eternal being anyway because matter's an illusion and all this stuff. But I kind of like to like, know it, you know, experience it. So if I can't experience it in this world, I'll experience it in some other world. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in favor of, you know, parahumanism, you know, chimeras, because we're just making ourselves better. You know, this is the, the, the natural goal. This is what we ought to do because we want to progress, don't we? We don't want to just stay what we are. That's not progressing, is it? You know, it's staying and progressing. I mean, it's easy to understand which word means what. Neural implants, mind uploading, all this artificial intelligence. The singularity is, is sort of this thing that futurists angle for, which is defined simply here as the theoretical emergence of greater than human superintelligence. Now, once that happens, the future becomes unpredictable because since we're humans now, we can't really imagine what that would look like. You know, maybe when we evolve to that point, then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get a grip on it. But right now, we really can't. So this is what, again, is, the op this is what is looked forward to optimistically. Okay. Uh, we want this to happen. So what does the new man look like? Well, we image God. I mean, we are God, but we image God. Well, how, what, what does that mean? Well, you know, we already know that we're God, but, but when we seek to progress and advance and do great things, and, and, you know, empower ourselves and become one with nature and all this stuff. We're, we're kind of behaving like God would if he were really a personal God. So we image him. You know, we, we're, we're doing the things that a God would do. And so that's consistent, isn't it? That's consistent theology. You know, we're, we're fulfilling the dominion mandate. Hey, you know, that old Bible thing talks about, you know, that God, you know, putting us on earth and, and saying, you know, subdue the creation and you know, have command of it and all that sort of stuff and you know, find out what makes it tick, you know, legitimizing the scientific enterprise. Those are good things that Christians should do. Resurrection is not needed you know, because consciousness is eternal anyway. But hey, you know, if you want to ex keep experiencing the, 
you know, the, the world as you know it, you know, we can, we can pull off resurrection here with nanomedicine and all that sort of stuff. You'll continue to be immortal. And if you die, you know, if you die in the right circumstances, we can probably bring you back or upload your brain somewhere else and you'll be okay. Uh, <clears throat> so we're becoming what, what the, the God of the Bible, uh, you know, myth that he is, in, in terms of personhood, uh, you know, we're, we're becoming what God intended. We're actually fulfilling our own eschatology. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're in command of our future. We're eradicating disease. You know, wouldn't the Bible approve of that? Come on. You know, we're transcending racial and gender divisions, just like heaven, you know? That whole thing about it, when you're in heaven, you're neither married nor given in marriage. You know, none, none of this racial stuff matters. None of this gender stuff matters. Why can't we have that now? <laughs> You know, it's, it's this, it's rebuilding Eden in our own image, uh, you know, to satisfy ourselves is what we're really getting at. So what's the theological cost? Well, we become divine apart from God's plan of glorification. It redefines salvation only in terms of the end, okay, glorification, rather than it, it dismisses the means, which is the cross, and the whole reason for it, which is sin. But hey, doesn't the Bible talk about humans being glorified and being in the presence of God? Well, I, you know, I kind of think that the New Testament's talking about, you know, our new, our new techno utopia here. You know that, you know, I know the, the the Bible makes it sound like God's a person, but you know, we've now discovered through science that, again, matter is an illusion, and we're all part of the same stuff that makes up the universe, and so, you know, how much more divine can you get? You know, how much more beyond human can you get? So, you know, why should we worry about what, what this, this primitive book says? I mean, at, at the base of it, it was correct, okay? You know, we, we, the supernatural is real because there's really no such division as natural and supernatural and all this stuff. I mean, you, you, I, I'm manipulating the vocabulary all over the place here because I only have an hour to do it if I have 50 years to do it, I can take it one piece at a time. It, it, it's just, it's not a difficult thing. Especially if you, if you have, you know, churches filled with people who aren't looking for any of it. And frankly, are biblically illiterate. I mean, let's just be honest. Um, they're, they're just, they're not, they're not thinking about this. And I, and I don't want to, I don't want to say church shouldn't be about fellowship and about broken people getting fixed and, and stuff like that. You know, that, that people do have real needs. I get that. You know, and, and frankly, I'd rather, I'd rather that kind of healing occur in church than anywhere else. But that is not all it is. Um, and I think we've, we've sort of drifted into our, what we get from pulpits on a weekly basis is, is psychology. We get felt needs stuff, you know, rather than, than anything that Anything that smacks of content, there's a low toleration for thinking in church, which is, is really going to put us in trouble at some point. I think it already has. But what about Jesus? Well, the divine, I mean, Christ is divine, of course. You know, he, he was probably a, you know, a human being that just understood all this stuff before we did. He was so far ahead of us. It took us to the 21st century to figure this stuff out, but Jesus was already there. You know, he was either a human who fully grasped all this wisdom and taught it for posterity and was, in fact, willing to die for it, you know, for the, for the truth of all this. Uh, again, what is that? Well, knowing that we would never cease to be separate from God, that, that we're all one. We're one with God. And the Jews didn't like that, so they killed him. You know, but, you know, Jesus is a, is a great example for us then. Or he might be a manifestation of eternal consciousness. I mean, maybe, maybe eternal consciousness, those little quantum particles, you know, that sort of, like, some of them became us, maybe some of them became Jesus and just brought all that advanced knowledge with him, you know, all that sort of thing. Or, you know, and when it gets right down to it, Jesus may have died on the cross, but he still lives. He's eternal. Okay, just, I mean, we're eternal too. Doesn't the Bible say that? Doesn't the Bible describe human beings as eternal souls, really? We're just, we just get these bodies for a temporary temporary stay here on earth, but we are really eternal souls. Don't you guys know your Bible? Yeah. The new Christology, Jesus lives and always did live. 
See, the eternality of Christ. We can affirm that. Jesus is our eternal brother. We're united to him. Salvation in this embodied life is being released from the fear of death. That was Jesus' message. You know, believe in what I'm telling you, and you'll have eternal life. Knowing that death is nothing, and we will be with God forever. Jesus was the divine messenger to humanity of these truths. That will preach. Okay, it's already preaching. Well, what do we lose? Well, we don't get Trinitarianism anymore because we can't really talk about persons when we're talking about God. So that, that's kind of a, a weird peripheral thing. The traditional gospel, you know, the meaning of the cross, I mean, that, you know, Christians of a century ago just sort of misunderstood that, you know, but you know, we, we get it now because we know more about the eternality of ourselves and our world and, and the universe, frankly. And salvation, of course, you know, this definition would sort of deny our nature. And, it, you know, it, it elevates our co-divinity with the Father and Jesus. You know, that, that might make Christians of 100 years ago uncomfortable. But, you know, we, you know, we know what that means now. We're just all one. We're just all eternal. So in summary, post-Christian Christianity actually has an old name that's been around for a long time. And that name is Gnosticism. Tried and true. Now, I debated on including this, and I'm looking at my time, and you know what? I think I can, so let's go for it. We'll try to be speedy here. This will be a really quick overview of what Gnosticism is if you don't know what it is. I drew this from my, a series I did on the Da Vinci Code. Somebody, someone out there may have seen so what is Gnosticism? The basics. Well, the Gnostics believe that there is something they refer to as the true God or the light. Or pneuma, which is spirit. And isn't God a spirit? I mean, doesn't John 4 say that? Okay. God is a spirit. He's pre-existent. You know, this God is pre-existent, uncaused, and perfect. Sounds pretty biblical so far. Gnostics imagined the true God of being both male, the father, and also female. And the reason they thought this was because everything else that exists is produced by this God. So in the Gnostic, you know, this is the early couple centuries of AD, and they don't really necessarily know where babies come from and all that kind of stuff. So they're imagining if, if this one true God produced everything, there must be something male in there and there must be something female. And then they, they produce offspring. So that's how they wrote about it to communicate the idea. Now, this true God or the light exists up here in its own realm. And then, so there's this sort of barrier that they sort of conceived of. There's the residence of the true God. And then down here is the created material world, which is really a far distance away from the true God. This is us down here, material stuff. You know. And in the middle, there was this middle world or spiritual world. And that was populated by other gods, other divine beings. In Gnosticism, they are referred to as aeons. And so the true God essentially took bits and pieces of himself or, or you know, the, this, this divinity thing that, that preexisted everything. Out of that comes different entities. And you notice I have the male and female here. And these are the spiritual beings, the other gods that the true God creates to do whatever he needs them to do. And again, below them is the created universe. This is, they're beyond the universe here. This, this is down here, the world we know. So these are the true God's essence in different forms. Together they are referred to in Gnosticism as the pleroma, the fullness. Collectively, all of these beings are the full essence of the true God. Now, in terms of cosmology, the highest eon is called in Gnosticism the Logos. Is that a familiar term? 
Okay, this is the highest son of the true God, the Logos. The first eon, the first emanation, the first act of the Father. He is the entire likeness and image of the true God. And this is, these are Gnostic statements. Okay? He's the form of the formless, the body of the bodiless, the face of the invisible, the word of the unutterable, you know, all these things. And he actually possesses the knowledge of all the eons. He is unquestionably superior. He's the top dog, the top eon. Now, the Logos, right here, again, is the top. And together, the Logos with the true God, the father and mother element in the true God, form the triad. Well, let's just call it a trinity and be done with it. <laughs> it's not the same as a trinity. If you know your Trinitarianism, this is not the same. But they're using the three language. Now, as the Gnostic story goes, one of the eons, in fact, the one closest to our world, the lowest eon, but still an eon, was a female eon, and her name was Sophia. She decides, you know, I love, I love the true God so much, I want to be like him. And he did all this creation stuff like he created us, so I want to create too. But I know that he doesn't really want me to. But man, I, I just can't resist the impulse to be like him and create. So in Gnostic cosmology, she does that. She rebels and decides to create her own thing, her own entity, just to sort of try it out and be like, be like the true God. Now, the result of that, Sophia, I don't know why she's not appearing up here, but she's not. The result of that, if, if you look at what Gnostic texts say, the Sophia wanted to bring forth a likeness out of herself without the consent of the spirit, the pneuma, the true God, or any consort. She didn't have any other help from any of the other male eons. And so a thing came out of her that was imperfect and different from her appearance. Why did she do it? Well, the Gnostics, of course, view this as a, as a transgression. So they have nasty things to say about Sophia, you know, that she was lewd and, and you know, the great cosmic whore and all this kind of stuff. What she makes is referred to in Gnosticism as the demiurg, which either, you know, mean it, fundamentally it means the maker. Okay, we'll get to why. He's also called Yaldabaoth, which is the child who comes forth, also called Saklos, the fool, also called Samael, the blind one, also known as Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible. Why is he blind to a Gnostic? Why is he a fool? Because he's arrogant enough to deny that there are any gods beside him. He ignores the eons. He ignores his superiors. He's blind. He's willfully blind, and he's a fool. Now, the Demiurg is sort of a, a deity unleashed to the Gnostic. Here's our little barrier to our world. As the God of the Bible, the Demiurg is the creator of our heaven and earth. And the Demiurg says, you know, I created this heaven and earth thing. I think I'm going to create something else. I think I'm going to create archons, rulers, to help me administer my own affairs in this heaven and earth, this universe. Archon, of course, is a biblical term. It's used in the New Testament for the principalities and powers and all that stuff. And he also says, you know what? On earth... I think I'm going to get together with the archons and we're going to create and enslave humans. Does this sound like Zechariah Sitchin, anyone? He's a Gnostic. Okay, that's all it is. Maybe he doesn't, maybe he never knew he was a Gnostic, but he was. 
Now, Sophia, which you can't see here for some reason, was horrified at this in Gnostic cosmology. She's like, boy, did I make a mistake. And now these poor humans, they're just going to be slaves. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? You know, I, I can't really, like, tell everybody what I do. You know, <laughs> what do I do? What do I do? Well, what she decides to do is she decides to inject some of her divinity into the man, into humanity. So he's not just a lifeless, brainless, soulless critter. He's more than that. He is. And so as he procreates with Eve, so is every human really inside divine. Now, what the problem is for Gnosticism is the human beings have to discover that. That's salvation in Gnosticism. Salvation in Gnosticism is knowing. Knowing what? Knowing this, that you're really divine. What your material world is a world created. The reason there's evil is because its creator is evil. He has built evil into the world, and you're trapped in it. Your only hope is to transcend this life by knowing, by learning and knowing that you are divine. You are in some way attached to the eons and attached to the true God. Does this sound familiar? Okay. And this, you know, this is Gnosticism. This comes from ancient, you know, texts. This is nothing new. It's centuries, centuries, millennia old. So if you look at our previous trajectories, we have an eternal divinity. Well, that there, you know, what we're really talking about is the true God. You know, we're, all this evil that you experience, the, the true God has nothing to do with that. He's good. And we're talking about eternal humanity. Obviously, we are eternal beings. We are divine. And the Logos, man, he's important. He is the top dog. Now, the rest of the story in Gnosticism, who's the hero? The hero is the serpent. Because it's the serpent who comes to Eve and says, hey, I've got a question. Did God really, and by God, he's referring to the maker, the maker of heaven and earth, the demiurg. Did God really say that if you ate of this tree, you were going to die? And she says, yeah, you know, we touch." We eat it, even if we touch it, we're going to die. Now, that, you know, that part she's making up. But he says, you know, you're not going to die. If you eat of the tree, your eyes will be opened. You will become as gods. You'll become as Elohim in the Hebrew text. So the Gnostic views the serpent as the hero. He is trying to inform humans of their own divinity, of their own connection back to the true God. And the Demiurg punishes him. So it is, it is a, a severe inversion of the Genesis story at that point. But it'll preach. I view Gnosticism as the one ring. <laughs> the one ring that unites and binds all of it, everything. You will find East and West thinkers articulating the very same thoughts. If you're familiar at all with Eastern religion, what I've just been going through is like, yep, bing, 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 you know, point for point, okay? It's just cast in a cosmological story that's different. All the elements are the same. It unites East and West. It unites all religions. Now, not, ever, not necessarily all adherents, because there are Gnostic Christians, and then there are those of us who aren't Gnostics. But yet, within the th umbrella thing we call Christianity, there were a lot of Gnostics. And there are a lot of Gnostics today who will take the term Christian. There are Muslims who are Gnostic, Muslim mystics. You, you can read, just read the mystical literature across the board in any religion. You're going to see all of this, okay, all of it. Evolution goes very well with it because we're progressing. You know, we're, we, we need to 
awaken to the fact that we're divine and then and then realize like wow we live in a world where we really can understand that all of matter all of reality and and this 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 thing that we imagine as god it's all one and the same it's monism everything is united all these experiences that people have or that I've, that I've had, they're real because of this thing we call consciousness. Our bodies are just a filter, like, like a radio filters sound waves. Our bodies filter consciousness. That's why we have deja vu. That's why we have this experience, that experience, visions and prophets and all this stuff. You know, it all works. It's all real. You get to keep it all. You get to affirm it all. So I think it's comprehensive. It's being validated by science. And what I mean by that is a lot of science writers are saying things that if you're a Gnostic, oh, you love it. Now, you know, there are a lot of science isn't directed toward proving Gnosticism. What I'm saying is, is a little bit different. That Gnostics have plenty to, to, you know, to choose from in the hard sciences to say we're right. Now, a particle physicist might look at them and say, you're nuts. Okay, <laughs> the physicists I know would, you know, who are believers, who are dualistic and Christian, but the Gnostic doesn't care about that because you know what? You know what the Gnostic knows that a lot of Christians don't know? That their numbers are increasing and your numbers are decreasing. You are becoming marginalized. Our view is becoming popularized. Okay, we'll get into pop culture here. But again, the academy's there, and of course, pop culture. Science, I'm going to run through this real quickly. This is a book, if you're into this, if you're into the physics, theoretical physics stuff, I would recommend reading this. You know, it might infuriate you, but uh, James Gardner is a lawyer by training, but he's published in peer review journals. Uh, he's into cosmology. And his first book was called Biocosm, and he advocates, now that, Ray Kurzweil, this is Kurzweil's opinion of the book, which is positive. Kurzweil is the guy who wrote the book, The Singularity. That we, did, you know, had a quote there from him. Gardner's selfish biocosm hypothesis proposes that the remarkable anthropo anth anthropic or life-friendly qualities that our universe exhibits can be explained as an incidental as incidental consequences of a cosmic replication cycle in which a cosmologically extended biosphere provides a means for the cosmos to produce one or more baby universes. Now that's a little dense, so let me try to unpack that for you. In his Q&A, Gardner's Q&A on his website, we have this. Question, what are the religious implications of the biocosm hypothesis? The hypothesis is inconsistent with traditional monotheistic notions of an unknowable supernatural creator. Well, that's honest. Right? There's a discernible and comprehensible evolutionary ladder by means of which mortal minds will one day ascend into the intellectual stratosphere that will be the domain of the superminds. Question, is biocosm just a religious screed in disguise like intelligent design? No. Biocosm is adamantly and consistently naturalistic in focus. Now, from Amazon, here's, a, a, I think, a better idea of what, what, what Gardner is saying. Gardner proposes a startling theory that a pre-existing super-intelligent race that inhabited a mother universe, you know, some other universe, created ours and tweaked the physical laws of our universe, of the baby universe they made, to ensure the continuity of intelligent life and itself. So all that design stuff that you creationists out there think is the hand of God, it's not. It's the hand of someone else. And all that, all that evidence for the Big Bang, you know, that, that, that the universe had a beginning, well, it, it did, but it was birthed by another universe. In other words, it, create, it creates the visual impression of a beginning. But there was something before it, and before that, and before that. It's eternal. It's an endless regress. And this is peer-reviewed. This is in physics journals. Okay, this is not like my website where I'm trying to pretend I'm a physicist. Okay. 
I'm not. Now, Gardner's second book, The Intelligent Universe, Artificial Intelligence, E.T., and the Emerging Mind of the Cosmos. In The Intelligent Universe, James Gardner envisions a third dramatic alternative, a final state of the cosmos in which a highly evolved form or group of intelligence engineers, has anyone seen Prometheus? Okay, engineers, a cosmic renewal, birth of a new universe, blah, 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 blah. Okay, I'm going to skip what, uh, the other stuff about Gardner. Uh, he quotes Gardner commenting on Orgel and Crick and life itself. If you're familiar with Crick, you know, one of the co-discoverers co of DNA, he believed in, in directed intelligent panspermia, that life on this planet, including DNA, was seeded by aliens. Now, Gardner critiques that a little bit. Basically, he's saying, I, I'm a little bit smarter than Crick here. But <laughs> Crick... Crick was one of those biology idiots. We're physicists here, you know. Now, what about religion scholars? This is Jeffrey Kripal. He is a professor at Rice University, PhD, University of Chicago, and an author that I think you should become acquainted with. This is his book, The Serpent's Gift, Gnostic Reflections on the Study of Religion. Okay, Kripal is a Gnostic. You know, I, I'd run into him every year at the American Academy of Religion. Okay, that's, what, that's what he does. This is from a review. This, again, is a peer-reviewed review of Kripal's book. And just look at what it is. Knowledge is the serpent's gift. Knowledge of good and evil, moral and ethical knowledge. We have not been expelled from the garden by the aforementioned petty and jealous God. We would have gone on to taste the tree of eternal life. Again, we forsook knowledge and turned to faith like they're mutually exclusive. Okay, again, this reviewer is reviewing what Kripal says, and very positively. Though most of us would agree that modernity has had its heyday, and the postmodernists make some very good points, we have yet to name, name a successor that can constructively direct us as a body of discourse forward into new forms of knowledge and understanding. And this is where Kripal steps in and reminds us of Gnosis, not just a bunch of dried out scrolls buried under a layer of pigeon doo-doo, but a viable, promising, indeed perfectly appropriate methodology that can take what is best from modernity and the Enlightenment and leave what no longer works and carry reason and the critical method forward, transformed into what is for better or worse a postmodern era. He's saying, look, we've had modernism, postmodernism, and the next thing that needs to happen is we, need, we as academics need to commit ourselves to Gnosticism. Okay, this is a religion scholar who teaches at Rice University. Now, I'm going to speed ahead here. Uh, let's see here. Because of pop culture. Now, the way Gnosticism is conveyed to us is typically through stories about extraterrestrials and superheroes. Okay? Because extraterrestrials, they can be the gods of old, they can be the archons. And again, you'll find this too. The discussion of, hey, are there similarities between the Archons and the CT stuff and blah, blah, blah. And superheroes, of course, who are part human but part non-human. They're evolving. They're mutants. They're progressing. Or they're divine and they just look human. And so this is how the ideas are, are, are committed through science fiction and comic books and all this stuff. Now, the result is really two. You get either a quasi-Gnosticism where Archons are you know, these extraterrestrials, using the extraterrestrial idea. And that's where ancient aliens is, are at, that, that, that whole idea in the whole series, that aliens put us here. And that's what Prometheus, again, the film was all about, Supposed, supposedly a prequel to, uh, to Alien. Now, if, you've, if you watch the movie, you wouldn't get Jesus in the movie. But if you look up the original script online by Ridley Scott, the reason why the engineers in Prometheus wanted to destroy their creation, that would be us, is because they visited us 2,000 years ago and we put them on a cross. That's right in the script. Now, there's a detailed review that I didn't write, but somebody else wrote on, and, I, and the guy might be a Gnostic, I'm not sure what he is, but he goes through Prometheus really closely and it, it's really remarkable at how many biblical elements and are mixed with classical mythology, the Promethean 
material. In that original script, if you want that, you email me and I'll send you the link, okay? Because we don't have time to go through it here. Now, what I want to focus on here, this is Prometheus, just a couple things. One of the writers to Prometheus was a guy named Dane, Damon Lindelof. Here are his, some of his recent credits, Cowboys and Aliens, Prometheus. The new Star Trek film coming out, he was a co-writer. And something that might appear in 2013 or 14 called 1952. 1952 is something you want to keep your eye on because this is from the, the blog, uh, the, uh, what's it called? It's about UFOs in film, cinematic flying saucers or something like that. <clears throat> and I can send you the link too. Disclosure through Disney in 2013. Disney's aborted 1950s UFO acclamation movie. Is it headed for the big screen? So this entry is about the fact that this writer, Lindelof, was allowed into Disney's archives, specifically into something that no one else has gotten to see because, well, it, unless they're still alive, that were alive in the 1950s, and that is this. In, the, in 1979, a guy named Ward Kimball, who was an Oscar-winning Disney animator, was at a MUFON symposium, a MUFON, Mutual UFO Network, and he told the story that NASA, or the Air Force, excuse me, approached Disney in the year, in the 1950s to request cooperation on a documentary about UFOs that would help acclimate the public to an extraterrestrial reality. According to Kimball, in exchange for that cooperation, the Air Force offered to furnish the production with genuine UFO footage. Did Walt Disney agreed and then actually started on the project, but it was tabled when the Air Force reneged on the film. It has literally sat in a file drawer since being handed to Lindelof. And so the supposition is that 1952, okay, the year that it was canned, is, is what the film is about. It's, it's about this project. Now you can go on YouTube. Disney did create an, a different UFO film that promoted the idea that UFOs and aliens were real. They never actually released it for public consumption. Uh, they, it, it got aired, I'm not sure where it aired, but it, it only aired once and it never actually made it like, you know, to, to consumer TV. But somebody has posted it on YouTube in three parts. You can find it. Uh, again, I can give you the links if you email me. Last point. There's a whole scholarly book. This is University of Chicago Press. This, and this is a dense read. It's a scholarly book called Mutants and Mystics, Science Fiction, Superhero Comics, and the Paranormal. And guess who wrote it? Our friend Jeffrey Kripal. He has an entire chapter. If you're into UFOs, this will be shocking to you. His entire last chapter is on Whitley Strieber and communion. The whole purpose of the book is to show how comic books, and specifically the alien theme, has been a useful and wonderful and delightful vehicle for transmitting the truths of Gnosticism. I mean, they're not secretive about this. <laughs> you know, it's just, here it is, you know? So again, I, I highly recommend that you read this. Again, he argues that much of the recent popular culture of the US comes from what used to be called the paranormal. He has a third book called um, Authors of the Impossible, where he as an academic says, academicians, scholars, ought to own up to the fact that paranormal stuff is real. And he's arguing in favor of paranormal stuff within the account. He obviously has tenure, you know, because we're not at the point yet where like we'd have whole departments of this, you know, in every university. But he is a committed academic and a committed Gnostic. And he's, he is, he is extraordinarily well read in comic books, pop culture, media, movies. If, if for no other reason than a reference book, you ought to have that. I mean, it's just really good stuff. So Kripal identifies a super story, a modern living mythology. 
and you know beliefs concerning alien contact and humans humankind's place in the cosmic scheme of things again showing how science fiction you know and fantasy owes less to science than it does to earlier occult systems he even goes into madame blavatsky it, none of none of this is new Okay, the whole alien thing is just rehashed Gnosticism slash occultism slash theosophy slash whatever, fill in the blank, for a technological society. That's all it is. And it's, you know, this is what's going to reach the masses. If you go up to the Internet Movie Database and put in the keywords alien, and 2012, you know, for the last year, there are almost 4,000 episodes, either, either episodes of TV shows or movies, just for last year. That doesn't count YouTube. Okay, that's the stuff that the IMDB tracks, that's, that's released, that you have to pay for. That is not YouTube. You know, and... Don't do too much of that or you'll start to get like me. <laughs> I mean, it's, just, it's just depressing on one level how, how exhaustive an effort this is. And it's going to change the way a lot of the church does church and does Christianity because you've got two choices. You either, <clears throat> you either stand in opposition to the world or you join, you adapt. And what I'm telling you, this whole presentation comes down to this. The adaptation is going to be led by people who know what they're doing and will control the vocabulary and teach others. They will teach others to mime the vocabulary and morph the theology. And it's only going to take a generation before that becomes the articulation of what Christianity is and if and why can't you get on board why are you so you know antiquarian or just odd okay so again all of these these last two sessions have really been things that have been floating around in my head because of the sequel to the facade so again I'm sure you're getting tired of hearing this but if you want to if you haven't read the facade you ought to um, if you have, go up to the website, join the mailing list so that you can stay up to date with alerts about the sequel. And of course, the website, you can contact me and follow me on Twitter there too. So that is the end. We can wrap up. And if you want to do questions, we can try to do that. Or if you got something to go to, feel free. Glad that you showed up for this. Hopefully it'll be informative. And interesting and maybe a little infuriating that's always good too uh, <laughs> we don't mind i've entitled this what you know may not be so and the subtext here is how biblical prophecy is unclear and why and i should preface this by saying that the reason i propose this topic and was interested in doing it, because I don't really do prophecy, but I, I have a concern that there are a lot of believers who are sort of locked in to one perspective in prophecy, and my concern is that if certain things don't pan out uh, the way you sort of expect them to, then it's going to have a very dispiriting effect on the church. I mean, I've actually seen people, well, the, the Harold Camping thing being the latest, um, where, you know, you read news articles and people will say, well, like, you know, since this guy was wrong, I guess, you know, I can't believe any of this Bible stuff. And again, that's, that's a gross exaggeration. But I think if we get locked into something, especially like prophecy, there is that danger. The fact is that there is very little that's self-evident when it comes to prophecy, really almost nothing. And I'm going to show you why that is. Why do people disagree so vehemently when it comes to biblical prophecy, there are actually reasons for it. 
And I'm going to give you a, a few of those. Not, by no means not all of them, but a few of them. So what I want to do is I want to illustrate the problems, again, plucking a few examples out, and then apply the results of those difficulties. So illustrating the problem. Problem number one is something I call clarity of intention. Basically, this is the issue or the problem of how do we really know what the biblical writer of a prophecy intended as far as fulfillment or what was the intended meaning or the intended outcome. How do we really know? Now, you might think, well, this is kind of easy for the most part, but it actually isn't. And I'm going to pick a very familiar passage here, Isaiah 7. Now, everybody knows Isaiah 7, 14, right? Behold, a virgin, the Hebrew is Alma, shall conceive and bear a son, and so on and so forth. His name shall be called Immanuel, which is God is with us. It's not, it's not a name. It's just a phrase. It's a verbless clause for your grammar geeks out there. Something that's so familiar actually isn't that clear. Okay, and for the sake of the audience, I affirm the virgin birth because it's taught in the New Testament. Isaiah 7.14, though, is actually tough. There's a reason why, now listen to this, there's a reason why no Jewish interpreter, Mishnah, Talmud, all that stuff, considered Isaiah 7 a messianic prophecy. Nobody did. And here's the reason. Have you ever looked at the verses that follow verse 14? We have here... Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Verse 15, he, the, the, the child, shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. Now, if you, know, if you know anything about Isaiah 7, the king okay, Ju of Judah, Ahaz, has a problem. There are two kings threatening him and his dynastic line threatening the kingdom. He's scared. So Isaiah, God sends Isaiah to go visit him. And Isaiah says, hey, look, these two guys that are troubling you, don't worry about them. They're just sort of, you know, sticks in the mud. They're, you know, don't worry about them. They're not a problem. God's going to take care of this. Go ahead. Ask God for a sign, and that'll encourage you. And then Ahaz tries to be pious and says, well, I just don't think I'm, I'm going to ask for a sign. That, that would be imprudent of me. And so Isaiah gets a little ticked at him and says, okay, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin, Alma, shall conceive, bear a son, you shall call his name Emmanuel. And by the time the kid's old enough to eat solid food, by the time he's weaned two or three years, you know, in Israel and, and our own experience, by the time he's able to discern good and evil, eat solid food, your problem's taken care of. The sign is for Ahaz. It is fulfilled in Ahaz's day. Right here we see it. Well, well, then how do we get Matthew? Let's go back here. How do we get Matthew down here? Quoting it of Jesus who lived 700 years later. How does that happen? Is Matthew like making it up? Did he goof? I mean, critics will say that. I think there's a clear answer for that. I think Matthew sees an analogy in the circumstances of Jesus' birth. We know that Mary traveled with the 12, and it was bigger than a group of 12. And, you know, Matthew traveling with Jesus for three and a half years, Jesus' mom's often in the group, and, you know, she's, he's going to hear the story, you know, about how Jesus was born. And then when Matthew gets older and it sort of dawns on him, like, hey, I'm getting old, maybe I should write this stuff down, you know, for posterity. He's thinking about, okay, where do I start? Well, let's kind of start at the beginning with the birth. And it's like, oh, yeah, I remember that story Mary used to tell us. And he think, he sees an analogy. This was a supernatural birth, just like, just, hey, that was, that's just like Isaiah 7, where God had a, a child supernaturally appear 
to take care of a problem, okay? To, to save who? To save Ahaz, who is in the line of Jesus. He is the, he's the, the line of David. So Matthew's reasoning by analogy, but the point is, if you looked at this, if you looked at the whole context, you would never guess that this has anything to do with an eschatological ultimate Messiah because the circumstances are given to you, point blank, right in the text. So I, I bring that up to reference the point, well, how do, we, how do we know what the original intent of a prophecy is? Because you, you, you'd kind of want to know that to know how it's fulfilled, to know what to expect. Another one is Matthew 2.13. This is where Matthew says, you know, again, he's recounting the circumstances of Jesus with his parents. They had to go down to Egypt to get away from Herod, and then they come back. And Matthew says, this happened, you know, because it is written, out of Egypt I have called my son. Well, did you ever go back and look at Hosea chapter 11? Okay. This is the Matthew. Behold, when they departed out of Egypt, I would call my son. Hosea 11.1. 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. What is that a reference to? The Exodus. Okay, think about the answer you just gave, and it's, it's the correct answer. It's the Exodus. It's not a prophecy. Hosea 11 is not looking forward. It's looking backward. But somehow, we see it in the New Testament as though it were a prophecy. Again, Matthew, again, my view is he's, he's thinking in terms of analogous. Analogous circumstances, because the only other place you see my son, God's son in the Old Testament, is of the nation of Israel. Israel is corporately called my son. When Moses goes into Pharaoh, what's the, what's the demand? Let my people go worship in the desert. Let my son do this and that. And then we also have it of the king, the Davidic king. So there's a conceptual connection there. When Matthew's writing the story of Jesus, he's thinking, wow, this is just like that. It's an analogy. And so Matthew puts it in. Like, this, this is what God was thinking. But if you just stick with what Hosea's thinking, he's not looking forward. He's looking backward. How can the backward look be a prophecy? And so, you, again, there's, there's a little bit of a disconnect between what you might read and what you might expect. Okay, so that we have to deal with that. So it raises the issue of how do we know what the original meaning was? I mean, is that even possible? Sensus planor is a Latin phrase which means fuller sense. Do prophecies have a fuller sense? You know, and if they do, how would we know what that is? Because we can read a statement and look at it and sort of think, well, I, I think I know how this is going to work. And that if it has a fuller sense that you can't even really conceive of, how are you going to, get, how are you going to figure that out? It, it's, it's, sort of built, it's a built-in problem. Now, one strategy to this, which is also a problem of its own, is how does the New Testament use the Old Testament? How do New Testament writers, when they quote the Old Testament, how do they interpret it? Okay, and the subtext here is, do they always interpret things literally? Okay. Here is sort of the textbook, one of the, the, the great dilemma passages for this. Do we always, should we always look at prophecy literally? Well, is that the way the New Testament writers do it? And I know, I know you're used to hearing yes, but look at this one. Here's Amos 9. In that day, Amos says, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. That they, it's kind of an odd plural there, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Now, let's read this. Let's take it literally at face value. What do you expect that to be talking about? The temple, some physical structure, because you're using verbs of building and restoring, and you have this reference to ruins. By the way, David didn't build the temple. 
So that's kind of odd, isn't it, to have that there? But you'd expect. In other words, you read that literally at face value, and it creates a certain expectation. Anybody know where this passage is quoted in the New Testament? Okay, this is something you need to do in your Bible study. Use those cross-references, because it'll tell you where it's quoted. It's quoted in Acts 15. Again, here we have our vocab. Notice that Edom and the nations are possessed here. Here's where we see it. I'll give you the whole context. All the assembly fell silent. This is when Paul goes to Jerusalem, the Jerusalem council, because they want to know, like, hey, what are you up to, Paul? We heard some weird things, like Gentiles are getting saved. Like, what's that all about? You know, this is our Messiah, right? Aren't you, are you still Jewish? You know, there's all these questions. So they meet in Jerusalem. They have this council meeting. And here we go. All the assembly fell silent. They listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simon, Peter, has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. Here it comes. Just as it is written, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it, that the remnant of mankind, what, what, what happened to Edom? I'll, I'll tell you what happened to Edom in a moment. That the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from of old. James quotes Amos 9 to validate Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. Tent of David obviously does not get a literal interpretation from James or the writer of the book of Acts, Luke. It's obviously metaphorical because who's the tent of David? It's Jesus. What? Say again? James, did you get that right? Did you read a book on hermeneutics before you said that? No, it was under inspiration, so he like passed hermeneutics. I got an A in that subject that day. Remnant of mankind changes from the object to the subject. And the word itself is different. Another slide. This is a little better here. In Amos 9, we have the rebuilding of the booth or the tabernacle or some structure, you would think, of David. But in Acts 15, the rebuilt tent is Jesus, the son of David. And here this rebuilding would happen so that they would possess the remnant of Edom. Now look at this. In Hebrew, this is three consonants. The little apostrophe here is the Aleph, Dalet, Mem. It's vocalized in the Old Testament with an E vowel and an O vowel. Edom, Edom. But when it's quoted over here, it presumes Aleph, Dalet, Mem is Adam, mankind. James changes the text. Under inspiration, he changes the text to make a theological point. Now, if we believe that the writer of the book of Acts and James was led by the Spirit, this is a textbook example of non-literal interpretation of prophecy. Just point blank, right in your face, there it is. It obviously violates the literalistic expectations that you would have of the Old Testament passage. Not only that, but here we have the Gentiles seeking the Lord. Here they were getting possessed over here. Here they're the subject, here they're the object. Like, what happened with that? Because James sees in Amos 9, James sees in Amos 9 the reality of Paul's testimony. But you'd never get there with a literal one-to-one -one ex expectation in the way we're sort of mentally trained to approach prophecy, which is why I bring it up. So if this happens in the Bible, and it does, this isn't the only place by any means, and it doesn't always happen. Sometimes there is a very neat one-to-one -one correspondence. Sometimes there's not. So if both things happen, 
how in the world are we supposed to read the New Testament, or even the Old Testament for that matter, and think about eschatology and end times, and come out with the right expectation and the right interpretation? Okay, I, I, I say all that to say this. Anyone who tells you that they've got this figured out, safely ignore them. Okay, there is no way because of the phenomenon we see between the Testaments, under inspiration, there is no way that you're gonna be able to do that. And you know what? You just need to live with it. You need to let God work it out and be happy with the results. You know, happy, obviously relative term, because we're talking about things like the day of the Lord, which isn't a real happy time. Uh, but you need to be satisfied that God knows what he's doing. And here's a, here's a tougher thought. He didn't really care to tell you all of the details. He didn't really care to tell the apostles either. You wonder why the apostles are running around with Jesus and he says something and they kind of look and they're like, what? Yeah. Really? Oh, if that's true, you can't, that can't be right. You know? Or they just, you know, you get the blank stare effect. Because some of the things that he's saying and that afterwards, after the fact, they go back and look at their Old Testament, after they've lived with him for three and a half years, after they've seen the crucifixion, the, the resurrection, all this stuff, they go, oh man, now I see how it makes sense, but I never would have expected. Right, it's clear to us because we have both Testaments. And what you need, right, exactly. What We don't have like, the written, like, Third Testament, you know, to validate what we think is going to happen in the end times. We don't have anything like that. And when you see, I, I highly recommend, every time in the New Testament you see an Old Testament passage cited, especially if it's Messianic, you go, look. You're going to get surprised. You're going to wonder, like, what was this guy on? You know, is there a textual problem here? You know, is there a footnote here that helps me out? Well, not, not really. I mean, that's just what they're doing. It's just what they're doing. Problem three, which I alluded to, and I'll be more explicit here, I think this is deliberate. I think prophecy is deliberately cryptic to a large extent. Example and premise, the substitutionary death and atonement of the Messiah King of Israel and its purpose, I suggest, was deliberately obscured in the Old Testament. You say, well, no, wait a minute. What about like Isaiah 53 and all that kind of stuff? We'll get there in a second. But I want you to think about the disciples. Do they really get this? In other words, when they have these conversations with Jesus about, well, like, you know, Jesus will say, well, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. The Son of Man has, must go up to Jerusalem and die. And they're like, what? You know, like, really? Don't say that. You notice that Jesus doesn't say, well, come on, you idiots, didn't you read chapter and verse over here? Don't you get that? If it was there, they could have read it. He could have quoted it. But there's something going on here that isn't quite clear. And Jesus has to tell them. He has to sort of unlock what's going on. He has to make the connections for them. Paul calls the whole plan of salvation a mystery. Well, if you could just go look it up, what's mysterious? Paul was right. It was a mystery. Paul was pretty smart, too. He knew his Old Testament pretty well. If he couldn't figure it out, we probably couldn't either. And the disciples, they need, you know, we need to cut them a break. Okay? There's no Old Testament prophecy that actually puts these things together. Substitutionary death. Okay, Isaiah 53. Do you realize... Okay, that's probably your best bet to getting the idea of, the, of a Messiah dying. But do you realize that the word Messiah never shows up in Isaiah 53? There are only two passages in the entire Old Testament where Mashiach is used of a future eschatological figure at all. Everywhere else, it's like the living David. You know, he's called the anointed because he's the king or something else is anointed, it's Mashiach, it's the same verb. The two are Psalm 2-2 and Psalm 89. Again, Psalm 2-2 gets quoted in Acts 4, Revelation 19, and there's an allusion to Psalm 89 here in 1 Peter 4, but there isn't a whole lot. And let's take Moses, let's assume he's the author of Genesis 3:15. 15 
which, by the way, doesn't actually mention a death. You know, the seed, the seed of the woman. All it says is that, hey, you know, someday, Eve, you're going to have like a baby that, or, you know, some human being is going to come from your line and he's going to fix this problem. Doesn't talk about death, doesn't talk about blood, doesn't talk about any of that. Isaiah wrote in the 8th century, okay, if you take I, the, 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 the 8th century figure as writing Isaiah 53, it's the 8th century. If you, if you do the two Isaiah thing, it's a, it's a hundred years later. That's the 700s B.C., Moses would have died around 1400 using round numbers. That means for 700 years, the Israelites went without the information that a messianic figure, and of course, by the way, Mashiach's not even in Isaiah 53, but they went without the idea of a messianic figure having to die. You don't get it for 700 more years. In other words, that's three times the time that the United States has been a country. It's a long time. So like, why? What's going on? Here are the references to Mashiach. You get the slides, you can see these, again, you know, where the term occurs. I was hoping to have my computer here because I could like run these searches on the fly, but we can't have everything. Here's what I think is going on. First Corinthians 2, Paul says, yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age. It's not their wisdom, who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, because if they had, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. They didn't know. Now, rulers here is a word I have here in red for two reasons, because the word is the same in both places. Here's the first one. Where am I getting up here? Uh, I can't see the color here. Oh, over there. Rulers, rulers, archon, archon is the lemma. Down here, same thing, archon, same word, same lemma. It is related to RK, and if you look at Archon in Ephesians 2.2 and RK in these references, they are non-human entities. They're the cosmic bad guys. What I'm suggesting to you is God deliberately didn't give the plan in the Old Testament because the cosmic enemies that he knew would be around would have figured it out and ruined it. So what does happen when Jesus shows up? Now, they know who he is. Thou art the Christ, you know, don't, don't, you know, kill us. Don't, you know, please send us over to that herd of pigs over there. And, you know, blah. They know who he is. They don't know the plan. So they're figuring, okay, he's here. Oh, crud. You know, now what do we do? We got to, we've got to get, we've got to get rid of him. So, problem solved. Let's like influence somebody to kill him. Let's just bump him off somehow. You know, we'll get the job done. We'll get rid of him, not knowing that that was the thing that needed to happen to enact everything else. Because like Paul said, had they known that, they would never have done that. Because the, the death of Christ is the beginning of the end for them. They didn't know. Prophecy was deliberately hidden. When Paul calls it a mystery, he's serious. Okay, he couldn't figure it out. Because it wasn't there. First Peter 1. We have this, again, this reference to, it was, I'll start at the beginning. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the suffering. I mean, the, the prophets struggled with this. Like, man, wow, what's going on here? This is kind of hard. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. You know, you people, the ones that have the hindsight, the ones that are writing the New Testament and reading the thing. Okay? The prophets had to understand and, and struggle with and accept the fact that, you know what? People are only going to know what this is about when it happens. 
it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news, that'd be us, okay? Those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Again, the verbiage there is that they were, they were kind of scratching their heads too. God kept the plan very close to the vest for a very good reason. By the way, this is a freebie, not related to the topic. I'll, I'll bill you later. <laughs> you know, we, we seem to have this odd idea that divine beings who have free will to do evil, obviously, or good, that somehow or another, their loyalties are settled. We talk about a rebellion of a third of the angels and we go to Revelation 12. If you actually read Revelation 12, it does not refer to the primeval past. It is connected with the inauguration of the kingdom, the king. How do I know that? Because the passage quotes Psalm 2. Again, look at the Old Testament. So we don't actually know we don't, we, we, there's actually not a passage that talks about an angelic rebellion, even though we know that, that there are adversarial divine beings there. We don't know that more of them can't choose to be disloyal. We do have two references in Job where God, it says point blank, God does not trust his holy ones. Okay, I think God had really good reasons for being really quiet and cryptic about it. I'm the only one who needs to know. I know how it's going to play out. So sometimes, even with crucial doctrinal ideas, God makes the revelation deliberately cryptic. So interpretation is, in an ultimate sense, or even in a, in a significant sense, unknowable until hindsight. So again, that should really give us pause and should, should produce some caution in us about our talk about the future, our talk about end times. Now, applying the results of this, what you know about prophecy may not be so because of these problems. I'm going to go through a couple of examples. Again, by no means not everything we could do, but we are limited. Abrahamic promises. Are they conditional or unconditional? Are they dependent on obedience or not? I mean, this is usually where the discussion focuses, conditional, unconditional, all that kind of stuff. I would want you to think, well, what about original intent, and how does the New Testament refer to the Abrahamic promises? So keep all of these things in mind. Now watch what we see here. <laughs> We all know Genesis 12, 1 to 3, the Lord comes to Abraham and says, hey, I want you to leave your country, your kindred, your father's house, go to the land that I'll show you. And he gives him this covenant promise, I'll make of you a great nation, bless you, make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, you know, curse them that curses you. We, we, we all know this is the Abrahamic covenant. It's repeated in Genesis 15. And we get a little more specifics here. To your offspring, God says, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, the river of Egypt is not the Nile. We know this from you know, a lot of other ancient sources. It's a, it's a wadi on the northern border of Egypt. Okay. I'll show it to you in a little bit. Continuing through Genesis, let's, let's tromp through the Old Testament a little bit. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Okay, what I'm going to suggest to you with good warrant is that the Abrahamic covenant is not simply unconditional. There are unconditional and conditional elements in it. And I'm going to take you through, and I know this will be probably, I love the Old Testament, so you're going to have to pardon me, okay? But I'm going to take you through a lot of Old Testament passages that specifically link obedience to this covenant and the land. Explicitly do it. Okay? Abraham couldn't accept the covenant from God and say, you know, God, circumcision thing, I'm just not going to do that. But I know that you already promised me something, so too bad for you. I'm in now. 
I don't really have to do that, right? Because you promised. You promised. Okay, we don't get to hold God's promises over God's head. That is not the way the game is played. In fact, it's not a game. Genesis 17. Why should you be blameless so that I may make my covenant between me and you? And I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings. So loyalty, loyalty to Yahweh above all gods is necessary. God said to Abram, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. Every male among you will be circumcised. Again, it wasn't optional. Genesis 22, we all know Abraham Isaac, the sacrifice passage. God says, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this, he was faithful, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to, he repeats the Abrahamic covenant. Bless you, multiply you. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. It's Genesis 12. Because you have obeyed my voice. So God comes to Abraham and he says, eh, man, this, you know, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son, your only son Isaac. And Abraham says, I don't really want to do that. And you know what? I don't really think I should have to do that because you already promised me this stuff. So let's do something else. He does not have that option. Deuteronomy 4. When you father children, again, Moses preaching to the children of Israel, and children's children have grown old in the land, if you act corruptly by making a carved image, and again, this is loyalty to Yahweh, you do not worship another. Okay. If you do this, you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You're going in to take it. I'm going to kick you out if you do this. Deuteronomy 5. You shall be careful, therefore, to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. Why? That you may live long in the land that you shall possess. Deuteronomy 6. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and statutes, so on and so forth. Why? That you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. Exodus 23. I will set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the Euphrates. Again, I'm just picking up again that thought from Genesis 15, the dimensions of the land. Deuteronomy 11:18. Lay up these words, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them. If you will be careful to do all this commandment, then the Lord will drive out all those nations. Your territory shall be from the wilderness to the Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, to the western sea. The land, again, is linked to loyalty to Yahweh. It is not unconditional. God expects something. He expects a, a loyal love from the recipient to him. You will not worship another. I am the Lord your God who brought you up from the, the, just the whole thing that we're so familiar with. Now, interestingly enough, this gives us a little bit of a quandary here. Here are these dimensional passages, again, the, the, where they give the dimensions of the land. And if you draw the line, I mean, here are the dimensions that are described here. Well, guess what? 1 Kings 4.21, Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Did Israel inherit the land or not? Well, there's this little strip right over here. It's just, it's just, you, know, you didn't get that. It's the Phoenicians. I mean, this is the kind of thing that prophecy experts, and I'm referring to scholars here, that's a problem. Did they get it or not? Because it kind of sounds like they did. But then what about this? Does that count? And even worse, do you realize that there are three or four different sets of dimensions for the land given in the Old Testament? 
This is from uh, Milgram. It's either Milgram or Levine's commentary in the Book of Numbers in the Anchor Bible series. This is kind of complicated. So you have the issue of obedience, and you have the issue of dimensions, like which set? Was it the original set, the set that like Moses talked about when they go into the Transjordan and conquer the giant tribe? I mean, what is the land? Leviticus 26. Here's a treat. It's a key passage. Did you ever think that you'd be talking about eschatology and get to Leviticus? Oh, yeah, Leviticus. I'm, okay, like I said, I like the Old Testament. You shall not make idols for yourselves, for I am the Lord your God. Pretty clear. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, then I'll give you, you know, all this abundance, but you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land securely. I will make my dwelling among you, walk among you, be your God, and you shall be my people. Very clearly Abrahamic language, linked to the land, linked to obedience. If you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, then I will do this to you. I will set my face against you. You shall be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you shall rule over you. But in, if in spite of this you will not listen to me but walk contrary to me, I will walk contrary to you in fury. And I myself will discipline you sevenfold for your sins. Could he be any clearer? I really don't think so. But he goes on. <laughs> I'm still Leviticus 26. I myself will devastate the land so that your enemies... Wait a minute, God, you promised. Yeah, I did. I did. And I expect something in return. I expect undivided loyalty, no matter what. I will scatter you among the nations. Then the Lord shall, in, or the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths and so on and so forth. You, know, you have to come back, you have to repent. Those of you who are left shall rot away in, the, in your enemy's lands because of their iniquity. I mean, it's, it's really dark language here. But if they confess their iniquity, then I'll remember my covenant with Jacob. I'll remember my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham, and I'll remember the land. Of course, this brings up a key question. Is this the state... Is this the spiritual condition in which Israel is? And then, of course, that begs the question, well, what is Israel? Well, we'll get, to, we'll get to that in a moment. Here's the kicker. Guess what? Leviticus 26 is quoted in the New Testament. The New Testament writer is using the Old Testament under inspiration. Quiz. Where do you think it's quoted and how? How does the New Testament writer under inspiration interpret Leviticus 26? Especially if we go back here, this part about confessing iniquity. Okay, belief. I was wrong. We're, we're sinners. We're evil. We're coming back to you. Where does it get quoted? Are you ready? 2 Corinthians 6. What accord has Christ with Belial? Remember, loyalty to Yahweh. Loyalty to Yahweh. Jesus is Yahweh incarnate. What accord has Christ with Belial, Paul says? What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of God. As God said, here's Leviticus 26, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. question. Was Paul looking for a rebuilt temple? Doesn't sound like it from there. Now, 2 Corinthians 6 and 1 Corinthians 3 are both passages that refer to believers, the believing community, as the temple of God. One is individual, individual believers. The other one is corporate. It's a plural pronoun. So both corporately and individually, we are the temple of God. And he quotes Leviticus 26. This is Paul. It's not Heiser, it's Paul. So, I mean, you, you look at that and you think, well, what, you know, what's up with that? Before we hit the rapture thing, again, I, I, want, I want to reinforce the point. The New Testament often does to you and I unexpected things. 
Now, does this mean that there is no future for what we think of as geographical or political Israel today? The answer is, I don't know. Because if you look in your New Testament, especially with Paul, Paul is explicit. Just as he said in 2 Corinthians 6, look, we're the temple. Why, why, why does the passage apply? I will make my dwelling among them. Because the Holy Spirit lives in us. And a gathering of us means corporately the Spirit, the presence of God, the thing that inhabited the tabernacle and the temple is in us. It's in you. It's in the body of believers. That's his point. We are that. Now, elsewhere, Paul in Galatians 3 is very explicit, saying that anyone who believes in Christ inherits the promises given to Abraham, Jew or Gentile. Point blank, Galatians 3. Those of you, you know, if you believe you are Abraham's seed at the end of Galatians 3, it's around verse 26, something like that. But then when you get to Romans 9 to 11, Paul talks about this Israel and all Israel and all Israel will be saved and this Israel and that Israel. I mean, you, you read Romans 9 through 11, it's kind of confusing. I think Paul leaves the door open to a future for a political, you know, the, the geographic thing we think of as, as the land of Israel. I think that's possible. But I'll tell you what's not possible, that the church should not be called Israel. The church should be called Israel because the New Testament does it. It does it point blank, it does it explicitly. Now the, the problem with, with replacement theologians as I see it, because I don't like any of the systems, right? You know this if you read my blog, I just don't like any of them. The problem there is, is going to Romans 9 through 11 and thinking that you know, we have to now sort of make these ambiguous passages sound like Galatians 3 or 2 Corinthians 6, and therefore we rule out a future for national Israel. That's just as, as illegitimate as doing the reverse. Okay, we just don't know. We don't know. And you know what? If that's God's plan, wonderful. If God has some other plan that, that it really, it, it's really about faith in, in Christ, that, and, that, and that's it, that's all it means anymore, wonderful. Doesn't mean we shouldn't support people or a nation when they do right. It also doesn't mean we should support them when they do wrong. I mean, again, we're Christians. Okay, we should have a higher ethical standard. But there are some passages that are just boom, just, just right there. And the reason we miss a lot of this stuff, and I, and I am, I am going to say this because this, this bugs me, because again, I'm, I'm an Old Testament guy, is that we spend almost no time in the Old Testament. And I know it's weird. I get that. But it's really important because the New Testament writers spent a lot of time in the Old Testament. Uh, rapture. Yeah, it was the Bible Jesus used. So, like, isn't that okay? Are you a splitter or a joiner? Okay, if you've read my, my blog before, you know why I'm asking the question this way. Let me illustrate it first, though. Somebody you're trying to disciple stops you after church and asks, hey, why don't the Gospels all agree on what was written on the sign nailed to Jesus' cross or any, any number of passages? I mean, you've read through the Gospels a lot, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Synoptic Gospels. They don't all agree on what's in and, and what's not in, and even if it's the same event, the exact wording. You know, we, we know that. If you've spent any time in the New Testament, you know this. So, like, why don't they agree? She wonders how the gospel writers couldn't get something like that right. One or all of them must be wrong. If you've spent any time doing apologetics or, or evangelism, you run into stuff like this all the time. So how would you answer her? Well, I think the inclination that we would all have, and here are the superscriptions. They're all different. It's one of the few things that actually gets mentioned in all four gospels, too. I think our inclination would be, look, what we should do with these is we should sort of think of it as like the life of Christ in stereo. You know, we should, we should put these things together into a harmonious picture, a harmonious account. We should harmonize passages, interpret one by the other, harmonize them. It's very natural. We do this in our own life. I, I hope I'm not making anyone lose their appetite here by referring to the house budget deal. 
But let's say you picked up the New York Times, Politico, and Reuters, okay, a story, and you read about the House budget deal. We've, Bonner in one account says, we fought to keep the government spending down because it really will help, or in fact, help create better environment. These are actual quotes, by the way. Another one says, this is the best deal we could get out of them. Another one says, I'm pleased Senator Reid and I in the White House have been able to come to an agreement, blah, 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 blah. Which one's right? All of them. The, the, it's, the Gospels are selective. There's a deliberate agenda for each Gospel writer. They are by nature, by definition of what they are. They are selective in what they include or exclude, how they arrange things. Again, we, we know this, so our inclination is to harmonize things, to put things together. You know, you collect papers on the 9-11 the event. I mean, how dramatic, how many times was that seen? And you'll, you will not find newspapers that agree with every word, even every detail, even the secret, you, you just won't find it. Okay, does that mean that one or all of them are wrong? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't have to mean that in any way. They could all have been, you know, picking some aspect of the story out, putting it in their, in their article. So why is it when we come to prophecy, instead of harmonizing, instead of joining, we split. It's the only place we do that. Here's what I mean. You read 1 Thessalonians 4, familiar passage, again, the so-called rapture passage. We declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, we who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of the command, the voice of an archangel, trumpet of God, dead in Christ will rise first and meet the Lord in the, in the clouds in the air and we will ever be with the Lord. Okay, the very, very familiar passage. Then we look at this one, Zechariah 4, and they say, well, here it says, on that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives and lie, that lies before Jerusalem in the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in two, blah, blah, blah. Hey, this doesn't sound like this. Or I could put Matthew 24 up here, which has a lot of similarities with 1 Thessalonians 4. But you look for differences and then you split them. Here's the point. You have a... You, the reason you believe what you believe about the rapture is because you have decided to take, if we put all the passages about a second coming, a return of Jesus, let's put it that way. If we took all those passages about a return of Jesus and put them all right here in front of us, you would either harmonize them or you would look for differences and split them into two events. If you're a splitter, you have a rapture and a second coming. If you're a joiner, you don't have a rapture. It's just a decision you make. Neither one is self-evident. The Bible doesn't have like an instruction appendix in the back that says, addendum to the last chapter of the book of Revelation, when thou shalt encounter a prophecy passage, split or join. We don't have an instruction book. We just make this decision, usually because we've read somebody who, who splits and then we decide, well, that sounds great, I'm gonna split too or we read a joiner and then we read a splitter. They're interpretive decisions that color, that dictate, that compel where you end up, where you come out. Another one, imminence. Again, these, these are all problems with certainty, okay, with, with, with what we do when we talk about prophecy. Imminence, whatever that means. Now, why do I put it that way? Well, people define imminence differently. Some people say imminence means Jesus could return in the next eye blink. In other words, there's nothing preventing it. Okay? Some other people say Jesus will return soon. That's what imminence means. It means soon. But there might be some things that still need to happen. Okay? Other people will say, well, it means Jesus will return unexpectedly. So those are the, these are the three most common definitions of imminence that you see. Well, if you look at 1 Thessalonians 5, okay, this is the chapter after chapter 4, the, 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 again, the so-called rapture passage. Now, concerning the times and season, brothers, you have no need to have anything, to written, anything written to you, so on and so forth. Look what happens when you colorize the pronouns. Concerning the times and seasons, brothers, Paul writing to believers, you have no need to have anything written to you. 
For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Isn't that an interesting juxtaposition? Because day of the Lord, you know, Old Testament day of the Lord, cataclysmic stuff, and here we have it linked to a thief in the knife with, night, with, which you would think you, you wouldn't like know what's going on. Again, it's, it's a little odd, the juxtaposition. You yourselves are fully aware, while people, you know, other people out there who aren't believers, other, other people outside the community here that I'm talking to, while people are saying, oh, there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. You won't be surprised. Okay. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Now here's the point. You go back to these definitions of imminence, how would you apply them to 1 Thessalonians 5? Well, the reality is, is that anything that smacks of a sign in the New Testament, heavenly portents, celestial things happening, the appearance of the Antichrist, you know, even, Jesus even said, you know, things like about, you know, even what's gonna to happen to some of the disciples, again, talking about, you know, the, his coming and, and how do we handle that now that we're dealing with a distant future, all this kind of stuff. Signs are relegated to the second coming only if you presume a rapture when you read 1 Thessalonians 5. If you don't, then you have no problem with things appearing before the actual return. In other words, these are decisions you make. I'm not saying any one of them is bad. What I want you to see here is that a lot of what you believe about prophecy, you believe not because it's just so plain from the Bible. You believe it because you're filtering it through, again, your things you've read, your experience, you know, the exposure you've had to certain things. You, as you study, you develop, again, presuppositions, presumptions, inclinations to look at things a certain way. It's, it's just a natural human thing. Does, I don't know which is right. I don't know if we should split or join again because there's no instruction manual. Okay? I'm not inspired, so I'm not going to tell you. Okay, you would have to pay for that. Uh, I'm just, I, I can't do that. What I want you to realize is that a lot of this stuff is really here. It, it, it's, it's decision oriented. It's, it's, pre, it's about presuppositions. It's about thoughts you bring to the text when you read it, that, that it is going to inform and guide the way you think about it. And someone else will bring another set of thoughts to the same text and come out totally different. And this is why, because there are ambiguities going on in the text. So conclusion, again, what I want you to get out of this is that you just be aware. You just be aware that this is sort of the nature of the problem. Again, there are things going on in the text. Again, there, there are things God does conceal. He did it a lot the first time, and it can be significant points. Things are cryptic. There's the problem of how do I know what an, an author originally intended? There's a huge problem of how, you know, I say problem. Just think about what, I, you know, what, what just came out of my mouth. There's a problem with the way the New Testament interprets the old. Now, there actually isn't a problem because they were inspired. If they don't want to see every passage, every prophecy literally, I, I, I shouldn't condemn them for it because I'm not an apostle, I'm not inspired, they were. And because they do that on occasion, again, it should give us pause when we look at the book of Revelation or the New Testament. And again, there's half a dozen of other things we could have gone through here that, that are equally problematic. We just lack certainty. So I think we need to be honest Let's just be honest with each other and have charity toward one another. Let's not be obsessed with this. Let's treat each other nicely about it. Agree to disagree. Have fun with it. Okay, how boring would the Bible be if you had everything in the can? I mean, honestly, why would you keep reading it? You know, the problem is, is uh, at least in my experience, I've run into people that really think they do have everything figured out. I don't know why they keep reading it. 
What's there to discover? Oh, I'll read this passage and get a buzz, you know, a spiritual buzz or something. Come on. You know, have a little bit of humility. Okay, there are lots of things that should keep you coming back. Okay, to Scripture. It should be fun. You, sh- you should enjoy the thrill of discovering things. And if, if you just sort of approach things, you know, and sort of shut certain topics off, you're not going to get to enjoy, again, the thrill of discovery in some of those areas. So I just want to encourage you, again, just to just be open about that, treat each other well. And when it comes to hermeneutics, last thought, use those cross-references. You'll be amazed at what you find. And sometimes you'll wonder, what in the world are they thinking? Okay, and when you find those, that's a good place to camp, you know, to study, because you'll, you'll learn some things there. So I am done. I should put my last slide. I always forget to do this. This is my website. If you want to visit it, please do. I like when people visit my website. Yeah, you're grinning. Isn't it? Uh, follow me on Twitter if you do, because I do you know, post things there. And if you're interested in the book, my novel, The Facade, and its sequel, go to that link, sign up for the email list, and you'll get notifications as I progress through that so you don't miss it, okay? Questions, Q&A.